evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, uh, Wednesday, July 1st, 2020, uh, general meeting. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? In pursuit of the general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County go into meeting closed session to discuss appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, <coughs> demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluations of appointees employees or officials whom this public body has jurisdiction to consider matters that relate to negotiations and to perform administrative function. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We will see you at six o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jeff. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Do I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes for the open and closed sessions of June 3rd, 17th, 24th, and the open meeting minutes for June 22nd? Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions, comments mo on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve the meeting minutes for the open and closed of June 3rd, June 17th, and June 24th of 2020, and the open session of June 22nd, 2020. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, board and staff involvement. Um, the board would uh, like to welcome our new board members, student board members. We have Natalie Smith from Queen Anne's County High School and Alexis Gross from Ken Island High School. They will be attending our August 5th meeting. We'll find them seats in our socially distanced room here. I'm very looking forward to having both of these ladies on our board, so thank you so much. Um, also for uh, board involvement, uh, Mabe contacted us uh, to have an, a new member from Queen Anne's County for the Legal Services Association. Uh, a, a, a director and an alternate. Um, I have offered myself for the two-year term, and I will ask one of the other board members if they'd like to be an alternate. It's for virtual meetings. So it's four times a year that Mabe had, needs these folks to get together. So we'll discuss that later. But right now, I have offered my services for the next two years. Um, for the superintendent, good evening. Thank good you. Good evening. Great. Thank you. So it's um, we continue to have a full schedule, even though everything is still pretty much virtual. Continue to meet with my both my superintendent groups, the General Juan Pazam and the Eastern Shore superintendents. Um, Although they are less frequent, we still have our COVID-19 calls with the county that uh, Mrs. Morris sits on and lots and lots of Tiger Team meetings. We also met with our uh, commissioners for our monthly collaboration meeting this month. On June 5th, I was a um, guest speaker for Celebrity Check-In sponsored by Upstream Alliance and Environmental Education or Environmental Literacy Agency and talked about what we're doing in terms of environmental literacy across the content areas. Last month, I uh, was so excited to mention that we have 100% of our schools certified as green schools, so that flows right into that. On June 8th, we took a... Um, a, uh, a group of us went to congratulate our new teacher of the year, Miss Amber Wright, who is a dance teacher at Kent Island High School. And uh, it was a great, great time there. Her parents were there and some other relatives along with Mr. Paluski and Mr. Strait, uh, Miss Andrews. There were several of us there, a principal, uh, assistant principal. So she was very, very well supported. So we are just excited uh, to have Miss Wright as our teacher of the year. And would also like to thank Thank Ms. Eflin, Ms. Heather Eflin, who was the outgoing uh, teacher of the year. We did not end the year as we wanted to with her, but we thank her for all of her enthusiasm, her support, and uh, for representing Queen Anne's County very, very well last year. So thank you, Ms. Eflin. On the 23rd, uh, I presented our con continuity of learning plan um, to the State Board of Education, and that went quite well. Hats off to all of our um, all of our curriculum and instruction and operations and all of our folks who were part of that and certainly to Mr. Paluski for his leadership with that continuity of learning plan. It was well done and, the, and we got a lot of compliments for our plan. On the 25th, uh, I was voted in to serve on the Board of Directors for Mayo. That's the Maryland Association for Environmental and Outdoor Education. I am excited to serve in that role and to continue to involve all of our schools in environmental literacy work and, of course, outdoor education. 
on the 28th. I marched with uh, a group of our students and some community members with the, with the Midshore Black Lives Matter, uh, Matter protest down at Love Point Park organized by one of our own students from Kent Island High School, Ms. Tanae Wright. So well done, Ms. Wright, and all of her, her peers who were there to support her and to speak on behalf of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, also, just to mention, um, at the end of July, I'll be guest speaker for UC Berkeley's Environmental Education uh, Virtual Summit. So that's an exciting event, and we're looking forward to that one and sharing all the great things that's happening in Queen Anne's County uh, in terms of environmental literacy there. I'd like to give a special thank you to Mr. Dunn, Mr. Lawrence Dunn, for supporting um, Churchill Elementary School. He, uh, he finished yesterday and he did a fine, fine job. Thank you, Mr. Dunn, who came out of retirement to help us out there. So we greatly appreciate that. I was talking to a student not very long ago who mentioned uh, how happy that he, actually it was on Sunday, the Black Lives Matter um, protest. And he mentioned Mr. Dunn and how happy he was that Mr. Dunn was there. And also to Ms. Janet Pauls, who served as our principal supervisor and also oversaw the mentor program. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your service, Ms. Pauls. Uh, we are just so grateful that we will be able to call on you for support this year as well. So to both Mr. Dunn and to Ms. Pauls, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that does it for me for now. Mr. Polisky, you have anything to add? I did. Thank you, Madam President. For the record, Greg Paluski, Deputy Superintendent. Just wanted to remind our public that we begin our universal mitigation uh, for our summer programs, which actually kicks off tonight at midnight. Uh, that is a free resource for all of our families in all of our grade levels, reading, mathematics, and language arts. So I just wanna make sure that our families know that that is there as a free service. Uh, we have on our homepage, uh, if you go to our, our headline topics, uh, please click on that. We have a website design with all the information they're also receiving information from our schools. Uh, also, just a reminder to our public, grades 6 through 12, there are content modules that are available for those students as well. And also in students grades 9 through 12, there's an SAT prep uh, that is offered for free as well. So I just want to make sure that our public and our parents know those resources are there. Please check out our website. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 650, uh, citizen participation. Public comment? Did we, we didn't have anything? We, we, we did have some parents who wanted um, to express them, themselves with regard to the um, pilot that we ran for the virtual program. And we will certainly make sure at the next opportunity for public comment that we read their, their comments. Yeah, I, I, I apologize, no I didn't print it out. No worries, we can get that. Thank you, I apologize. Um, and we had nothing else, Mrs. Wright? Nothing, no. okay. Thank you so much. Presentations, uh, parent and teacher survey results, sir. As we go to um, retrieve our staff who are socially distant out there in the hall waiting to come in and present, we do have quite a number of presenters tonight. And uh, just as they enter, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and offer our sincere thanks to all of our teammates who have been working so hard on our recovery plan. The surveys that they're gonna talk about tonight are the teacher survey and the parent survey. As we got a lot of participation, we are so excited for the amount of participation we got there and, um, and the responses and how they will play into the plan that you hear tonight. And we'll still have additional opportunities for parents <coughs> and our employees to make comments after we have presented the recommendations for tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Louisa Welch, who is principal at Bayside Elementary, and of course, Mr. Adam Tolley, who is the supervisor for CTE um, and a whole a history and um, a whole lot of other things. Great. All right, good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight uh, to share the parent survey results. Good evening and thank you for coming. Good evening. So we had a tremendous response to the, the parent uh, survey. Um, the numbers there show uh, the percentages of uh, across the grade levels as to who responded. 
um, more elementary uh, pre-K to fifth than anything, but we still got a very good response uh, for our middle and high school. And we have um, at this point, even today, just about 2,500 responses. So we feel like we got a good, good response from parents. So we asked uh, first question on the survey, how would you describe your level of comfort with your students returning to the school buildings this fall? Uh, more often than not, they felt comfortable, about almost 70% said that they would feel comfortable sending their student back to um, a school building in the fall. We also wanted to know uh, from parents what factors uh, influenced that decision about your student's attendance uh, in the fall. Uh, most uh, people said that the most important thing was confidence that uh, Queen Anne's County Public Schools, um, and I apologize that it got cut off there, um, but it's confidence that Queen Anne's County Public Schools will ensure all safety measures are in place in all areas of the school. So that's something that I think we need to clearly communicate that we will be doing and ensuring that our students are safe. Uh, there was also a high percentage of um, folks that said no increases in the level of confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases or hospitalizations in our area. And also a uh, top uh, choice there was a PPE requirements for staff and students. So that's a consideration that is, is very important. Uh, noted on here that availability, availability excuse me, of childcare was a little bit lower. However, I think with some of our plans, that's going to be uh, an, an increase in concern for parents as we communicate those. We uh, presented a couple different um, ideas in the survey and we asked parents if schools were open at 50% capacity with an A day, B day schedule, what's the likelihood that they um, would send their student to school on campus to take advantage of the learning opportunities face to face? Um, and 76.8% said that they, they would send their student back um, if schools worked at 50% capacity. Um, that dropped to just below 70% if schools were at one third capacity. 33.7% um, uh, said that if offered in the fall, they would opt for 100% virtual online uh, school experience for their child. And at this point, uh, only 5.4% said that they would not plan to send their child back to a school building. We also wanted to know about how they plan to get their children uh, to school. So uh, we asked in the fall, how do you plan uh, for your student to travel to school? Um, over 60% would be planning to utilize um, our Queen Anne's County Public School buses for transportation. Um, and almost 40% there said parent would provide transportation with, of course, a slim majority that are, or a slim minority rather, that are walking. Um, but I have a feeling that more parents than previously will likely want to transport their own child. Uh, the next question uh, asked parents about what their um, preference would be reopening schools in the fall, thinking about a two-day versus a three-day rotation, a weekly rotation. Um, or elementary face-to-face -face with secondary being remote or distance learning for all. And this was really a kind of a split um, across the board. Um, more often than not, I think the highest percentage there was 36% that picked the three-day rotation, um, but it really, there wasn't a clear, um, clear winner there, uh, but f over 14% said that they wanted all students to continue distance learning. <coughs> We also asked again about our internet service uh, to confirm that. Um, that is data that we've collected previously, but we want to ensure that we have correct data there. Uh, so we have a, a good number of our parents that do have internet service. Um, however, there's a, a small percentage there that have a uh, mobile hotspot or um, do not have um, internet service. Um, so those are, are people that we'll need to be very careful with about how we're providing that, those learning activities. And if they do have internet service, um, is it reliable? Um, for those that do have internet service, um, almost 83% have pretty reliable internet service. 
All right, so I'll pick up from here. Uh, next question uh, revolves around engagement uh, during the period of, of closure after uh, March 16th. Did your child engage in distance learning or complete assignments via paper learning packets? Uh, so 65% distance learning and um, only 7% did paper packets uh, based on our respondents and 27.5% were uh, on for both. How much of the day was your child participating in learning activities from their school? Uh, some of the day, which was the biggest uh, portion here, 65% were doing it. Some of the day, uh, very little, 18.5%, and then uh, most of the day, about 16%. Next question, um, as you can see, you know, very close 50-50 split. Was the amount of instructional time during distance learning appropriate for your child? Uh, again, 50% uh, each way. And then I'll address that just a little bit more when we get to, to the end. How would you describe your child's workload during distance learning? 50% uh, said it was, it was just right, and then the other 50% split uh, was too little, 31%, and then 17% was too much. So it kind of balanced out uh, in that regard. And then this just kind of breaks down um, each of the, the uh, components that was the most helpful that we wanted to see what parents thought really worked and that we wanted to try to gauge that so we could prepare for uh, the upcoming year. And as you can see, the, you know, the top one at, at about 63%, Google Meets with teachers um, leading and modeling instruction. And, and that is a theme that, that we saw uh, pop up in the open-ended responses that I'll, I'll talk about as well. Uh, video instruction again, high percentage, and then as you can see, it kind of falls off a little bit after that. But the you know the, the clear um, piece of information to garner there is that the the parents really felt that the engagement by teachers was uh, was helpful, and so uh, that's that's certainly an important piece uh, moving forward in our plan for next school year. How concerned uh, are you that your child may have gaps in learning when when school reopens? Um, so. Slightly concerned, small percentage, 30% are very concerned that, that there are gaps, um, but we just wanted to gauge to see where, where parents thought they were and you know what, what we need to do to address those gaps when we start back next year. How frequently did your child need assistance with completing assignments? Sometimes, you know, again, 50%, and this is you know, common throughout here, um, never 20%, and then almost always you know, about 30%. Next question just deals with challenging, uh, how challenging was the schoolwork? Almost 70% said somewhat challenging, um, and then you know, a small percentage was very challenging. Again, going back to the, the teacher engagement part and feedback, how helpful was the feedback? Uh, feedback was somewhat helpful, 50%, and uh, then again, we split that other 50% between the other two categories. Social emotional supports um, that we wanted to gauge for, for families. Uh, again, you can see the correlation here the, the, with the top response, 75% check-ins by teachers, support staff, counselors, just again, that, that engagement continuing uh, those relationships with students is very high on, on the priority list. Um, and then, you know, the next questions deal with basically the, the structure of the schedule, you know, what, what type of structure is there, um, how that is um, done, breaks in the schedule, communications, uh, counseling, those sorts of things. But again, uh, the top part there is just those, those check-ins and that engagement with, uh, with teachers and, and staff and the families. Um, and before here, so that there was one other question on the survey which basically allowed parents to um, address any other concerns. They had open-ended uh, response. And in, we had out of the 2,500, we had about 45% that actually put responses in. And, and we were trying to look through there for common themes to see if there was something really that, that emerged to the top. And it was just, just, there was nothing that really just jumped out to the top other than 
um, the engagement. A lot of parents talked about the engagement and how important it was for um, teachers to interact with their children, how much better they did if there was a face-to-face. -face. Um, so that's certainly something that we have taken into consideration for, for next year. Um, other concerns that just popped up, you know, which was also addressed in the survey, the PPE, you know, the concern about wearing masks and students at, at various grade levels, students um, with disabilities and having to wear masks. And it's just a, just a concern that's on, on the mind of parents. Um, and again, the, the structure of uh, the day and just, you know, what the, what the lessons look like. So those were sort of the, the themes that kind of emerged, but nothing, nothing predominantly, just overall, you know, concerns and just parents really wanting the best, you know, for their kids, so. Okay. Any questions? Anyone? Yeah, one question, it might be good as Sid. <clears throat> right now, and going back to the slide, the, the buses, 60% will go on bus, 30, 38% won't. Is that, what do we, I mean, what, what is it right now? Do you have that off the top yeah. of your head? So right now, our bus transportation, we're looking at for elementary uh, and middle school, you're looking at about a 75 to 80% rider uh, participation. Uh, high school goes down to about 50 to 60. So looking at the numbers that were on that chart, it did appear to me that there was about a 10% drop in uh, ridership there based upon the and the other thing is, I might be doing something wrong, but I don't see this on my board docs. No, neither. We only have the teacher survey yeah, only, results. Only the teacher yeah, one can we make sure we there. post this? Because, I mean, then the public can see it. Yep. They'll see it on TV, but if they need to go to it, they can see it, because I think, I think there's some interesting information there, but it should be available to everybody. Yeah, we, 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 we'll have make sure that it's up there. We submitted it, but we'll make sure it's up there. If they press F9, it should be up there. It's okay. just didn't go through their um, thing. All right. Thank you. I was looking for that too, and I can't go back. Can you go back to like the third? Sure. So I should have looked at the number one. The third. Slide. Which question was it? Captain uh, The one that had that, oh, that one. Um, what, what were you trying to say? No increases in, I mean, I'm sorry. So a failed bit of childhood. Yeah, what factors would influence their decision about whether or not they were gonna send their child to school? And the, the wording on there was, um, confident, I'm sorry, no increases in level, the level of confirmed COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in our area. No increase. Yes. In okay. And then the second one was that they didn't have childcare. Or the availability of childcare. Or for would them. that, would that influence their, uh, their decision whether or not to send their child back to school for face-to-face -face learning? Oh, whether we provided childcare. No, whether the child care availability. Is, availability. Yeah, is available. Yeah, well, we have PFY stuff afterwards. No, no, no. That. There's a lot of child care providers that are not open yet. Right. So if they don't oh, have. Oh, in the county. I think that was county. probably more than yes. Okay, I couldn't yeah. understand what, yeah, what that meant. Um, and, um, okay, so as per pertain to them, I, I didn't remember that question, but work financial issues mean based on their personal situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And could you back up one more? Was there was another, no, I'm sorry to go down one more that one there that's um if schools open at 33 percent capacity so i think words, that question will make a little bit more sense when we come back in to present the possibilities for for opening um and when we created the survey one of the ideas that we had talked through was um an abc day schedule um if we could only get eight to nine kids on a bus However, I think we have some new information that has, so this survey was created to get out, you know, to parents as soon as possible. But as you know, that information changes day to day, sometimes hour by hour. So that question will make a little bit more sense when we come back and present the plans. Okay, yep. all right, thanks. Because I, I don't understand that one. That, right. Okay, got it. So basically the, the first one, 50% capacity would be like an A day, B day schedule where we'd have half the population right. come into a school. The second one would be an ABC day where only a third would come at one time. So what, the question was what though? I don't understand the question. What if schools it? are open at 50% capacity in the fall, I will send my student to school on campus to take advantage of learning opportunities on a staggered schedule, A, B day. So they would only send it, they would send it only if it was at 50%, well, more. They could 50. check all that applied on okay. there. We okay. kind of wanted to gauge um, any it. of them that they, where they weren't, you know, gonna send them back. I get it now, thank you. All right, any other questions, Mr. Anderson? Yeah. So the responses uh, percentages were broken out by those who responded. 
So uh, there should be no uh, re, uh, I guess, examination of, of the responses from those who didn't uh, answer. In other words, do we have any cross tabs that show any uh, reliable information that we didn't get from some defined group or some defined classroom in some school or anything of that sort? There that are some things that we could do to look at the levels to, to cross reference that data. Um, but it's, it's also an anonymous survey too. So we don't, I, we didn't collect what school they were coming from and things like that. Well, if we have a developmental need, it would be good to know where that need and those assets could be applied. So what's going to happen is another opportunity, parents will have another opportunity to respond. So this afternoon, this evening, you'll hear recommendations from each of the Tiger teams, and then we're putting that back out there for public okay. comment so they can comment where it's even just, more this narrow. This is the teachers. This is no, just this parents. Is, so This one is parents. This is just parents. Oh, yes. and, so, and, and we'll never, I mean, surveys you generally don't get 100%. No. Um, so there will be families that we don't hear from, um, <coughs> but we will go with probably the majority. I was very pleased that we had <coughs> oh, it was just about 2,500, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which really is pretty good. good. And, and the beginning of the survey there, you don't ask if you're elementary, middle, or high school. Yes, we, yes, we did do that. I apologize. Yeah. No, that, I didn't you're see fine. it on here. There's so a I, lot of information on here. We Thank had... So I'll look at it when it comes on yep, here. Thanks. About 55% about were elementary and pre-K to 5, uh, almost 40% middle school, and 42% high school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Up there right there. So the reliability yeah, uh, with a margin of error, if you applied it to the entire population, is actually quite low. It is. I think we got a pretty good sampling across yeah. the county. Okay. Great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any, Any other questions? You, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you mind taking a wipe and sure. wipe in that front? Thank you so much. Thank you both. Sure thing. We'll see Have you a nice a, a little while. Thirty day of summer. They'll, they'll be back. I'm we'll sure. be back. Yeah, we'll be back. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. See you again. You get tired of us. Good job at that. There's other opportunities. We go to 50 to 50 percent. Thank you. All right, and so Mrs. Schreckengast is going to speak with us about the teacher survey. Uh, Ms. Schreckengast, as you may know, is principal at Mattapique Elementary School and lead for a Tiger team. So thank you for being here. Mrs. Schreckengast, you're us. Thank you very much. Um, I am the project manager of Tiger Team 6 along with Mrs. Kayleen Kovach, who had a family emergency and can't be with us this evening. But we um, are leading the efforts of Tiger Team 6, which is focused on recommendations regarding staffing, professional development, and um, teacher evaluation. And so we worked closely with several several Tiger Teams, um, both Tiger Team 2, responsible for continuity of learning, and Tiger Team 4, responsible for social and emotional learning, to develop a survey for teachers. We really believed that teachers needed an opportunity to share their experiences with us, to reflect immediately upon their weeks that they spent in virtual learning, and to share reflections as well as um, maybe their needs moving forward, as well as their priorities. So we were really pleased um, with the survey that was sent on June 16th of 614 teachers in our district, 441 responses we received, 72%. So that was truly representative of a great majority of our teachers. And you can see the breakdown by elementary, middle, and high school. Our first question asked them to reflect on the online technologies that they used during distance learning. And you'll see there to the left, um, over 90% of our teachers use Google Meet, 82.5% use Google Classroom, and then incrementally, we dropped with YouTube, online textbooks, Screencastify, the Wonders program, which is our um, reading and language arts text program, and Khan Academy. 
as the professional development team, we were curious of those teachers, were there any who felt comfortable enough with the technology they used to be willing to deliver professional development to others. And of our 441 respondents, 37 of them said that they would feel comfortable and were willing to present on one or more of that multitude of different um, technologies available. The third question was asking them how confident they felt using the technology tools that their school had to support distance learning, with one being the least confident and five being the most confident. And you can see there, three, four, and five really house the majority of the responses. The next question <clears throat> asked them to consider if distance learning continued, what overwhelmed them the most about the idea of virtual teaching in the fall? And this, along with that last question, were check all that apply. So these percentages um, will show you how many, the percentage of respondents who selected these um, top topics. So the very largest concern is student attendance, followed by motivation, quality of work, grading, social emotional wellness, technology availability for students, and parent support. Some other topics that came up um, in their responses were language barriers, um, providing valuable feedback to students, their own personal comfort with technology, and over and over again in the other category, teachers expressed concern about relationship building and said very clearly, our advantage this year was that we had relationships with our children, with our families, they trusted us, we could enter this confidently. But they have reservations about developing relationships virtually with children that they haven't met before. Then specific professional development that they would desire. If virtual learning were to continue, I would benefit from. And again, this was a select all that apply. And tied for first place um, were professional development to improve virtual teaching capacity and tips and tricks to simplify the process. Close behind that, blending distance and classroom learning, content specific resources, time to collaborate with peers, um, and new resources with an elevated level of virtual teaching. Other responses that came up were trauma informed practices, flipped classrooms, again providing feedback, building relationships, and accountability measures, as well as meeting the needs of some special populations. For example, our English learners, students with IEPs, and those early childhood grades, our primary grades. How do we virtually teach children those very basic building blocks of education? The next question was about providing support. And this was really focused on what we as principals, assistant principals, supervisors, and our reading math and teacher specialists could do to better support teachers in this virtual environment. And the largest um, response was for model lessons. They wanted to see what virtual teaching looks like. Mm -hmm. Kind of tied collectively for the others were mentoring, providing feedback, and coaching. This next section is about communication and the helpfulness of that. The first is how helpful was the communication from administration, school leaders, supervisors, district leaders during this distance learning period. And 45% said quite or extremely helpful, 32% said somewhat. For number nine, how helpful have your school leaders been in resolving challenges related to distance learning? 57% said quite or extremely helpful and 25% said somewhat. These next questions um, were centered around scheduling and time. So this tw number 12 was daily distance learning schedule should be, and the majority with 45.6% was consistent across the grade level or school. That blue chunk of 24.7% was consistent across the district, and the gold chunk at 29.7 was determined by individual teachers. Number 13, the amount of time students were to be engaged in learning was 69.2% read said adequate. 26.3% um, felt it was insufficient and a very tiny sliver said it was excessive. Number 14, how much time did you spend communicating with students and their families each week? For that, 31% communicated with students and families more than 11 hours a week. Number 15, select the average range of planning time you required per week to prepare for distance learning. With that one, the largest percentage was six to eight hours of planning time a week with 33.4%, but you can see um, there's considerable responses in each category. 
with 26.6% spending over 11 hours planning. This next question is specific to the needs of team four, our social and emotional learning team. Um, and knowing, this was phrased for teachers, knowing that training on ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and zones of regulation is forthcoming, rate your current comfort level providing social and emotional support to your students. And you can see that the majority at 38.5% fell right in the middle out of three. And this will be useful information for that team as they plan professional development on those topics. And the last question was open-ended. Um, it allowed teachers to, to share what additional supports they need to have that balance of work and home life during distance learning. And we just looked for themes among 441 responses. This chunk of answers came out pretty consistently. They requested clear, consistent, and equitable expectations and accountability for both teachers and students, a flexible schedule for teachers to balance teaching and family obligations, consistent, clear, and timely communication, a set schedule for teaching and learning. Some felt that they were on call all day and night, um, additional resources for home teaching, improved internet access, professional development opportunities, daycare, and access to teach from their physical classroom. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, definitely. Some of the questions, uh, were they reflective of the experience they just had? Oh, okay. So that's why there were some uh, gaps that we probably won't see in the future, because hopefully we will take care of those gaps. We're starting from a different point. Correct. And yeah. that is our hope, to have these responses so that we can prepare them better uh, All what, of us better. Just generally speaking, do you project for the future if we continue to have these uh, episodes of school shutdowns? Do you think we're ready? That's not what the survey was about. Pardon me? That's it would seem to, th I would seem to uh, take from the results that we would be. Well, when I come back with team six to share our recommendations, we've done a lot of thinking about these responses. So hopefully I'll be able to address that Good. a little bit. Then. I'm glad you're thinking about that. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. I have a, a question. Uh, on the 14, so the next to last one, I could just clarify what the adverse childhood experiences what, 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 I don't understand what you're, the special needs kids? Um, no, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a specific training um, that Mr. Evans is going to talk about with team four. Um, it's. It I didn't want to jump in, oh, but it, 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 it helps educators, and it's not just for educators, actually. Um, we have some certified trainers here that we got our training offered through the county, and it helps us to understand the experiences that students have had that may be related to trauma and things that will impact how they learn in school, how they interact, build relationships with each other, with adults. So, and now all of that impacts learning and how we ought to be working with those students. So, Mr. Um, Mr. Evans and, and and Crystal Chambers are working on that. That's going to be a big part of the professional learning that we do moving forward. So did they have that? That's how they were able to answer this question? Or There are members of our of staffs that have had that training. Our counselors, um, teachers have not yet had that training. Oh, so okay. we tried to word it to explain that those things are coming. Oh. But knowing that they're coming, rate your current level of comfort. Does that make sense? Current level of comfort of providing social and emotional support to students. Oh, so like a before and then maybe you'll have an after. Okay, all right, I got it. Exactly. Thanks. You're talking about teachers who, if, when these students, if they come back into the classroom and they've, we've experienced all of this COVID, we call it COVID fears. Um, so our, our teachers, by looking at this, teachers seem to be pretty comfortable for the most part. Mm -hmm. That's what you were asking. Yes, yeah, so they're comfortable even before having this training. Right. Correct. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Mr. Anderson. Yes. Probably the stupidest question you will hear. What's better, a one or a five? Oh, I'm sorry. A five is the best. <laughs> I was assuming that, but that's the absolute traditional bell-shaped curve. You're correct. If there had been anything else, I'd been suspicious. And I apologize for not labeling that. <laughs> that's but okay. yes, five is most comfortable. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank well done. Thank you, Mrs. Shrek and guys. Thank you so much. So our next presentations, uh, Queen Anne's County Public Schools Roadmap to Reopen Plan. Is that correct, Mr. Poliski? That is correct.
And so as uh, Ms. Dabluski gets set up, uh, just to, to lead into, there will be a number of, of our leaders coming um, to present the recommendations from six different Tiger teams. And what we're going to ask is that you would please hold your questions for that particular team until the end of that team's presentation. You'll know when we are coming to the end because you'll see a slide that um, has some uh, financial pieces on it. So that sort of sums up the needs for that particular team. So um, for the record, of course, Mr. Paluski, Deputy Superintendent, myself, um, Superintendent Andrea Kane. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you and the public with some major recommendations on our district recovery plan to reopen schools for the coming school year. The plan is organized just as our continuity of learning plan was organized. So this part should look familiar to you. Uh, the structure is phase one, two, and three. We're talking about planning and organizing, implementing and supporting, and of course, evaluating and making adjustments to our plan as necessary. The structure involves, like I mentioned before, you've heard before as well, six different teams. We're gonna talk about planning for the next 24 months. And this is phase two of our um, stakeholder teams. Team one, facilities and operations. Team two is continuity of teaching and learning. Team three is accountability, um, grading and reporting. Team four is going to talk about social and emotional support, which we just got finished speaking about. Team five is technology and connectivity. And team six is staffing, professional development, and teacher evaluations. And Mr. P is gonna speak with you about some of the timelines that we're working with. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. So what we wanted to provide to you is uh, really some strategic milestones and essentially uh, our timeline uh, of when we started this work. So we kicked off uh, in just late May, our second phase of our Tiger teams. Um, the executive team uh, under leadership of superintendent met with our Tiger teams. You can see throughout the month of June uh, to be able to check in on where they were in the process of making some recommendations. You just heard of the teacher survey results and the parent results uh, that were kicked off in the middle of June. Um, and then the final recommendations just a few weeks ago were delivered to the executive team and then refined uh, for today's presentation of July 1st, which you'll see as well as the public will be the first time that you'll see the recommendations that have been uh, made by cross-functional teams. Uh, very proud, we've had teachers represented on this, leaders represented on this. Uh, every facet of our school district and every function of our school district has served on any one of these teams. Uh, and we'll come back here at the end, but just to give you a preview of that, uh, after tonight's presentation, this will go out on our website for public comment and input uh, from the 1st of July to the 24th. Then we anticipate getting some feedback, making some adjustments, and then we'll be back to you on August the 5th for a revised presentation of any recommendations. And then on August 14th, which is uh, dictated by the state that all jurisdictions in the state of Maryland have to have their plans visible to the public uh, no later than August 14th. So just to give you a little timeline of where we've been, where we are, and where we're headed. And with that, um, I will shortly get our first Tiger team. They'll introduce themselves to you and then begin to go through their round of recommendations. And on cue. <laughs> they are ready. So we'd like to thank Ms. Uh, Carla Pullen. You've seen Ms. Pullen before. She is our facilities planner and project manager for Tiger Team One, along with Ms. Maria Fellers, who is our coordinator of school nurses. And you were introduced to her uh, last meeting as well. So thank you both. And we are ready to hear your recommendations. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. For the record, my name is Carla Pullen and I'm the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And beside me is Maria Lagaris fellers She is our new school health services coordinator and she is the fellow project manager for our Tiger Team number one. Maria and I were tasked with the oversight of recommendations for facilities and operations. And we're responding to six key focus areas in regard to daily operations and the necessary support for our school system. First of all, we wanna give a sincere thanks to our Tiger Team number one members. During our discussions, the greatest emphasis was always on the safety of our students, of our staff, and of the families. And I think that's important to note. 
We understand that there is a wide spectrum of feelings and beliefs in regard to the COVID-19 virus in our community. And we're fortunate in our county that we are still seeing a relatively low percentage of confirmed cases. And we wanna assist by keeping the transmission numbers as low as possible. Because there are still many unknowns in what will happen in the future, we felt that it was our responsibility to err on the side of caution when deliberating over these recommendations. So I, I say this often and I'll continue to say it, the guiding principle to keep in mind and what all decision makers should be mindful of is that as long as there are cases of SARS-CoV-2 in the community, there are no strategies that can eliminate transmission risk in schools entirely. Um, so the goal, our goal as decision makers, is to keep the transmission as low as possible so as to safely continue school activities. The first key focus area is building access. So recommendation number one, if required by the Queen Anne's County Health Department, we would screen all students for fever and symptoms at the earliest point of contact. We have to remember that confidentiality with that screening has to be maintained at all times. Point number two, we ask staff to self-screen at predetermined entrances at all of the buildings and notify their supervisor if they have symptoms before they enter the facility. Number three would be that we forego outside visitor access at this point, except for immediate student needs, such as IEP meetings or something uh, a parent would need to meet. And in that case, we would limit the visitor access to either the front office or to a predetermined conference room. The second area of focus, building utilization. We would recommend a 50% capacity of students at each school at any one time. And this aligns directly with the recommendation for six feet of social distancing from the CDC. We would recommend that we declutter all classrooms to house only the essential furniture and learning tools needed on a daily basis. We would recommend creating student and teacher cohorts so we would limit the number of person-to-person -person contact, and that would also help us to assist in any type of contact tracing or mapping that we may have to do if there was a positive case. We would recommend adjusting schedules so that students utilize only one classroom and one restroom per day. Again, minimizing who they are in contact with at any given time. We would create physical markers that notate the direction of the approved path of travel and necessary social distancing, much like you see in our grocery stores and our large box stores at this time. We would recommend using outdoor spaces where feasible for instructional space. This of course would be weather permitting and safety permitting because we wanna maintain all of our safety guidelines that are currently in place. Media centers should focus on use of digital resources as opposed to the traditional book checkout. Either that or the traditional books would be quarantined for a certain amount of time once they were returned to the school to assure that there was no um, incident of virus. We would recommend providing an isolation space for at-risk students and staff. This is a space that would be used for those people that need to utilize the building for their educational needs. And we would assure that we were cleaning and disinfecting on a more regular schedule, looking at the types of finishes that were used, the type of ventilation and filtration, so that it was a very safe space. <clears throat> We're recommending no use of the Queen Anne's County Public Schools buildings for outside groups at this time due to contact tracing efforts as well as the increased sanitation and cleanliness that will be needed. No shared storage and equipment. All supplies should return home with the student at the end of the day. This would include lockers, cubbies, instructional tools, even computers and we would recommend installing physical barriers where we're not able to maintain that six feet of social distancing. So places like the front desk in the main office, in the cafeteria at the cashier station, at the nurse's office where students are coming directly to see the nurse. 
We've already surveyed 14 of the 16 buildings and have some of those physical barriers already in place. The next key focus area is cleaning and sanitizing. We're recommending that we follow all current CDC guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting. There are some very specific procedures in place. We are recommending that we alter the current custodial schedules to provide more coverage during the school day, where right now the schedules provide more coverage for cleaning at night, and add additional staff as necessary to help maintain those CDC guidelines for cleanliness. We would ask that one custodian or staff member be assigned to provide some sort of continuous sanitation of all of the high traffic areas during the day. This would be door handles, levers and knobs, uh, handrails, things that are touched by many different people during the day. And we would also recommend scheduling hand washing, cleaning of desks and any other high traffic areas directly in the classroom and then even floors after food service and, and schedule these as daily tasks at certain times throughout the day. Transportation is another key focus area that we've been looking at. The recommendation is that we provide the maximum capacity on each school bus at no more than 22 to 24 students and we realize that we could potentially see even less of a capacity if we're imposed to follow CDC guidelines, which would require six feet of social distancing. That would be one student per every other seat for about nine to 12 students per bus. CDC guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting of commercial vehicles is important for our transportation services as well. We would recommend staggering arrival and dismissal times at each of the buildings and this would be looked at on a case by case basis so that we're minimizing the large groups that could potentially congregate at one time. And we would ask that we enforce student walking zones for those students that live close by and would not require transportation. development of school specific plans for greater car traffic as we anticipate that we would see more parents dropping off and picking up at dismissal. It's recommended in some of the Maryland recovery plan and CDC guidelines that it would be helpful to open bus windows for additional air circulation. However, we realize there are limitations depending on the student use group as well as allergies, asthma, so there are many other things that need to be taken into consideration. We would restrict any food or eating on the bus. Buses are most safe if we load from the back to the front and then unload from the front to the back because that eliminates how many times students have to pass one another in a close proximity. And we would recommend following all MSCE guidelines on students with disabilities and or IEPs. Food service is another task group that we looked at. Recommendation is for grab and go breakfast at either a kiosk or another acceptance point as the students enter the building. And then they would eat that breakfast in the classroom. Lunch would then be served in the kitchen by student cohort group or by student class and they would then eat in the classroom as well. All food would be served in closable to go containers with disposable utensils that could be easily carried back to the classroom. The serving line would then be sanitized between each of those student classes or cohort groups. So as every class leaves, the space is then sanitized again. As I mentioned before, we're looking at installing protective shields at the serving points in the cashiers, where again, there's some close contact. Sodexo, our food service provider, is looking at adding additional <coughs> staff as necessary, especially for the cleaning and disinfecting portion. And the recommendation, again, because there are so many regulations for food service that we look at USDA, MSDE, and any CDC regulations and guidelines and follow those as necessary. So our preferred model for this is the students go to the serving line to get their food and then eat in the classroom. 
We've communicated with Sodexo at great lengths. They're working with many other counties in both this state and in other states and felt that this was a very safe method of getting food service to the students. We're gonna talk about some of the other ramifications of that in just a few minutes when we get to some of our budget discussions. In the classroom, there is some issue potentially with food allergies. So there will need to be um, some protocols written for how food contamination is handled. And we are also uh, looking to MSDE to see if additional food waivers are going to be offered. We wanna know how we're gonna to continue to feed students that are not in the school buildings. So we'll be looking for guidance on that to come. School health and nurses is an, the next focus that we looked at. We're recommending CDC recommended PPE use in all buildings. We believe that a protocol needs to be established to determine what PPE is acceptable. As a school system, we need to outline how that's gonna be provided to students and staff, or if it'll be acceptable to bring from home, and then train everyone on proper use and cleaning. We also believe the school system, system should develop guidelines for hand washing and for healthy hygiene behaviors and provide the necessary breaks to implement those. And we believe this will help outside of the school building as well. The school system will provide the necessary soap, hand sanitizer, paper towels, tissues, trash containers that need to be utilized for proper hygiene. We're recommending identifying an isolation space for those that display symptoms of COVID-19. This could potentially be within the nurse's station. It could include a temporary move of the nurse's station, um, but we're keeping in mind that students must remain in full view of the nurse at all times. So we have been studying uh, all of our nurse's stations in the past few weeks as well. We're recommending that we utilize only communal bottle fillers in our schools, not communal water fountains. So only the space that would allow you to fill um, a water bottle, not the one where you're actually getting your mouth very close to the fixture. We recommend including outside ventilation and greater air filtration. This is something that we are already employing in our buildings. Um, so we will just be looking at greater ways to enhance any of the filtration. There are specific CDC guidelines for cleaning and sanitation after an ill occupant is determined to be in the school and it doesn't necessarily include shutting the entire building down, but there are specifics. And so we believe that we should follow those. We're asking that we provide some basic first aid supplies in classrooms, things like band-aids and, and small items that the teacher may be able to handle for things that the student doesn't necessarily have to see the nurse for. And that would be just to minimize the amount of traffic that is then going into the nurse's stations for the greater incidents that could be happening. We wanna work with the health department to identify a protocol and a process for sending home ill students and staff, as well as instructions for when they're allowed to return. And we wanna develop a protocol on either physician's visits or documentation for our at-risk and vulnerable students and staff, and also for those who are unable at any point to wear PPE, as we're recommending. Athletics, the Maryland uh, recovery plan asks us to assemble a return to play committee. That is already a group that's in process and uh, Mr. Pender and Mr. Harding, the athletic director at Kent Island High School um, are leading that charge. And they are working very closely with MPSSAA for the guidance that they are uh, implementing for return to play. 
Again, CDC guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting any equipment and not sharing equipment are important here as well. If we have a hybrid return to the buildings, we would recommend a partial team-based practice, and then a full return would be full team-based practices again, but again, following all of those athletic association guidelines that we mentioned before. One of the last pieces here is communication and compliance. And this was not something we were necessarily tasked with initially, but as we started meeting with our group, this continued to come up that we first feel that the county health officer needs to weigh in on any of these decisions, as well as legal counsel. There should be someone that is designated to respond directly to COVID-19 concerns and that is well versed on all of the HIPAA and FERPA information um, and that would be either by school or by county point of contact. And then we felt that it's very important to have specific protocols for how all of this information is going to be relayed to parents, to students, and to staff, and to make sure that it's clear and consistent. With these recommendations, we've determined that there are some potential financial impacts for each of our focus areas. For building access, if we're required to do temperature scans, we will have to purchase additional thermometers, probably four per building at a cost of around $4,500. With building utilization, we have the social distancing markers. We're estimating about $500 per building, 14 buildings at $7,000. The isolation space that I mentioned for those, the population that may be vulnerable or at risk, but that need to utilize space within the buildings, we're estimating about $1,000 per building, and that would include any type of change of finishes that we needed, any increased ventilation or air circulation, um, and additional cleaning, as well as the documentation of how often those, that area is cleaned. For building access, we have recommended no use of outside groups at this point, and that would be a loss of revenue in the amount of $250,000 plus. So that is something to take into consideration with that recommendation. The plexiglass barriers that we are looking at, we've recently found that plexiglass is in high demand and the prices have shown it. So we're looking at potentially $1,500 per building, uh, could be a little bit more or less. We're focusing directly on our elementary schools first, and then we'll move on to the middle and high. We're looking at about $21,000. Cleaning and sanitizing. Just for us to start in September, we have a cost of $300,000 for many things that are already on order. That doesn't take into account ongoing maintenance. At this point, there are foggers and larger equipment that has had to be ordered to get us ready for that September start. So we don't anticipate that it would be this much going forward, but there will need to be ongoing purchasing depending on how long we are in a revised mode. Custodial assistance, if necessary, potentially a cost of $20,000. This is if we need to bring in outside assistance to deal with either a building that needs to be fully sanitized from top to bottom, but the cost, um, especially in these times, is elevated. We know that we will see changes of some sort to bus routes and the accommodation for the proposed scheduling models that we're talking about, at this point, there really is not a good way to put a dollar figure on that, but we know that there will be implications of some sort, potentially savings. We just don't know until we understand what that mode of education will be. I mentioned to you food service and the preferred delivery would be for students to come to the kitchen. Um, again, talking with Sodexo, we feel that this is a very safe option, especially if they're sanitizing between cohort groups. We also realize that there could be an economic impact of up to $361,000 a year. And this is just in the a la carte sales. 
This is just the items that are in addition to the lunches that are provided. And if food goes to the classroom, we certainly can't take as many a la carte items or as many choices and selections to the classroom as students can get if they're coming to the kitchen area. If we are taking food to the classroom, as opposed to the students going to the kitchen, we also have an additional expense of $50,000 because we need to purchase carts and bags, insulated bags that will help to keep food both hot and cold as we get that to them. School health and nurses, we are looking at PPE and PPE that will need to be provided by the system. $70,000 to start in September, depending on how long these ramifications last, this would be ongoing maintenance as well. If we are not using water fountains, only bottle fillers, we would certainly suggest that student bring, students bring bottles from home, but we also will need to provide water bottles in each building so that students have something that's refillable. And again, we're looking at the modifications to the health suites in the elementary schools. At this point only, we feel that we have about a $5,000 cost in currents. For athletics, transportation, if we have a much smaller number of students that are able to board a bus, we believe that we'll have about $28,000 in additional cost to get students to their athletic events. There is a loss of gate revenue in the, to the tune of $40,000 per high school, so $80,000 overall if we don't see interscholastic sports starting again in September or this year. So we have a total loss of revenue amount, almost $700,000 for possible implication, and then uh, some costs for you to understand that are in the area of $525,000. Thank you very much. I have a question. The five thousand dollars, the elementary school modification. What, what is that? What will we not, not the specific, structure? Not the structure itself, but for the health suites. Yes, it could be the um, separators, the roller screens, the dividers between an isolation space and the well space. If we're not able to physically identify another location in the building where we can safely keep the students that are exhibiting symptoms, okay. it can be um, anything from finding another staff member or you know obtaining another person to monitor that student if there isn't line of sight it could be um, additional HIPAA filters within that space like freestanding so if we don't have windows that we can open to allow for flow of air um, and that's a that's an that's our estimate that this the equipment is very expensive but we're trying to work with what we have and there are some smaller items such as there, there are additional cots that need to be purchased. If we're using a nurse's office as the isolation space, we may need to move their desk right outside and we have power and data needs for their computers. So it's, it's smaller items as well that we've identified. I was thinking some of the schools that we haven't renovated in a long time, those health suites are smaller than right. the health suites we built, uh, what, at Southersville Middle School? Yes. That was bigger. So um, the one size fits all space for health suites is going the way of the dinosaur yes. because of the, the illnesses and the needs that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. The acuity and care that we are providing for students in the building um, is of concern. Um, you know, if we have a child that's immunocompromised in a space with someone who is exhibiting symptoms, how are we going to protect the vulnerable st student? but also meet the needs of monitoring and keeping the child that is exhibiting symptoms um, safe. Have we looked at empty classrooms to possibly be, okay. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure one of, at least one, most of the class, the buildings have at least one classroom that could be used as isolation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, just, we've looked at those okay. and, and some of the concerns is just the distance from either an entrance or an exit so that we don't have to take a sick child throughout the entire building. Um, distance from the front office if there's any type of communication that needs to happen. Okay. So, and we've been trying to coordinate with principals to get their feedback on how their health suite works. Okay. And so, and I think you may have mentioned earlier, but a um, 
sort of a building inventory assessment was yes. done and they did walkthroughs for each of the buildings so that they could see the number of kids and where spaces could be in those uh, additional spaces as well. You talk about an at risk, what is, what is a at risk person you're talking about? I, so, or children or? It could be a student, it can be a staff member. Uh, everybody is at risk, right? right? Just by the nature of this particular um, SARS-CoV-2 <clears throat> virus that is the cause for COVID-19. So it's higher risk or more vulnerable population. So an at-risk person can be someone, or a, a vulnerable person can be someone who has comorbidities or other health conditions that makes them more vulnerable to severe illness. So they're gonna have all separate areas? I mean, the way I, you use that risk often in there is just, this, those children are, are taught differently or different? No, our no. goal is always inclusivity and equitable education. Mm -hmm. And so if we can identify, that was one of the things that was mentioned were for an isolation space to keep the, the parents who want the children in the building who have um, comorbidities or puts them at a higher risk, we have to figure out a way to make it as inclusive as possible. So that is, that is our dilemma. <coughs> so they're completely taught separately is that what you're saying we leave it up to the parent to some degree it that's what the survey results there are a popu a portion of our population of parents that are not going to feel comfortable sending their at risk or higher risk student to school but for those folks that are comfortable and willing to send them into school this is where your school nurse is going to be really key because there has to be active communication before school even starts to, to guide that parent to reach out to their provider, first of all. The decision has to be made between the parent and the provider. Is it really safe for the child to come to school? And if that is identified, the provider can set for us orders or guidance, whether it's part of their emergency action plan or their health appraisal, that'll guide us in how we can safely implement education and sharing space with other students. And we would anticipate that this would be um, students that need to access the building to get their educational program, but may have some sort of uh, vulnerability, but that we need to get them in the building to get them what they need. Okay. Do these numbers take into account, and I know some of these lost income things are lost, but that we're doing a 50% population in the buildings? Yes. So. Yes and no, because some of that we just don't know the ramifications of yet. Um, what we have looked at is the fact that for nursing staff, we should only have 50% of the population in the building so that it would be um, less students visiting the nurse's office than what would be in a typical school year. Um, same thing for transportation. We only have half of the students boarding the buses, but at it's the same, same time, bus. we're probably running the same routes and we're running the same bus. And the 50% capacity really comes into play if we're going to keep in mind the CDC guidelines or recommendations of physical distancing. That's really what drives our, our numbers. Following up on that, if a student becomes symptomatic in school, then somebody has to research who that student yes. was near uh, in order to isolate them, otherwise, you have a, a plague inside the school. So that's where we rely heavily on the health department, whether at a local level or at a state level. And that's why it's really important for us to consider the cohorts um, or the smaller groups and the traffic within the school building, the exits, the entrances, because we would be able to do, be more rigorous in our contact then tracing and mapping. you have to figure out what to do with the people that the person was in contact with. Yeah. It it's just gets protocol, very confusing very quickly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, that's where the health department and whether it's at a local level or just, there are guidelines and policies that we're going to defer out. to because they, they're the ones that are going to pick up the phone and they're going to start reaching out. And we're able to say this student was in a classroom with 15 other students or 10 other students. I actually do that at work. I'm a contact tracer. So once I make contact with the initial person, I then contact everybody they tell me about to give them a heads up and what they should be doing next. You'll be busy. Mm -hmm. I think you might be busy. Oh, we're busy now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but still questions? preserving the yes. pay, but uh, yeah. still preserving that student and that family's confidentiality. Correct. Right. Right. 
you said additional staff cl cl will be cleaning by Sodexo. So Sodexo does the cleaning during yes. the lunch process? Yes, so following CDC guidelines, in between each of the cohort groups or classes, there would be a sanitizing done of any of the high traffic that's areas. Sodexo does that, not our custodians? Yes, Sodexo okay. would be responsible for that. Okay. Uh, my other question is, we're, we keep saying 14. Are we not going to have a rise during this period? We always say 14 buildings. Are we looking at a rise in this discussion? Well, well you, we're going to get to that with um, the next probably team two reports okay. with regard to um, plans for how we uh, bring students back. So yes, but we're talking about specific schools. Okay. And um, when we talk about, just to be clear, when we talk about 50% capacity, we mean per day. So at some point, you know, each of the elementary schools would have, we'd have 100% of the students attending, but 50% on Monday and the other 50% on Tuesday that way. So that's the A day, B day piece. Um, how would we, and maybe this will be discussed later too, you're talking about students remaining in one classroom. High school, that's not possible. Secondary schools, it's very difficult. And I believe more of That's the Tiger teams, yep, have done a lot of research on that. And we'll talk to you about that. Okay. Um, let's see my other question. Is it, uh, fever, uh, checking for, so temperatures you're talking about every single day when they walk in the building, they'll be taking the teachers and staff? If required. And, and Maria can talk to you a little bit in, in more depth. Yeah. So that. when we're talking about temperature screening, it's an active health assessment. So who's going to be doing an active health assessment? What staff member is going to be doing that active health assessment? If it's required, we also have to keep in mind that implementing a symptom check system or a self-assessment form are options for us. But keep in mind that with temperatures, it, the recommendation is not to, to use it as a screening tool for well students and staff. So. And the reason for that is the evidence does not support fever alone as a good indicator of COVID-19. Asymptomatic people can spread disease. So we don't want to rely heavily on something that is not rigorous. And we would use that as like a second tier symptom checker so that if there's someone with other symptoms or that they report to us, hey, you know, I was around some, you know, my, my cousin had it and I spent all weekend with them. Then once they go to the health suite, that is where the assessment, the temperature check um, would be done. Um, there's a risk, there's an additional risk for exposure to the person who's performing the temperature check, so that's something to keep in mind. And there is inaccuracy of temperature in uncontrolled settings, whether it's because of the device that's being used or the environmental fluctuation. So to ask that a student's temperature or a staff member's temperature be taken on arrival to a school building, that's not scientifically supported. It would have to be after they were in the building for about 10 minutes, because you have to take into consideration the temperature of the bus, the temperature of the climate around them. So that that's really a second tier assessment. In every doctor's office in this county shoots you uh, a check for temperature before they let you in the office. It depends on why you're there at the provider. Are you there for because of illness? Or are you there for a well checkup? But it is a standard and it's usually done by somebody who's medically trained. Every one of can them do does it, it if you're just showing up. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. It's it is a guideline that's in the CDC. We're spending $400 a thermometer. We're talking about the ones that beam uh, and check your forehead for temperature. Yes, and it's only around $75 per, but we felt that we would need more than one per building. Oh, and sure and we will. do already have at okay. least one in each of the buildings. That's the thermal. There'll just be an additional need if we're required to do that. Okay. Part of their presentation had to do with custodians and buses. So is that going to be covered somewhere else? Because you can sounds, ask about custodians. It and sounds like we're going to need a lot more custodians um, for if we're going to be doing cleaning during the day and at night. I, I mean, I don't know if you analyze that. Or I, at least a shift in schedules. Okay. At least a shift in schedules. We're, we're, we're purchasing equipment to make it move more efficiently, like electrostatic sprayers, where we can sanitize 50,000 square feet in one hour or handheld sanitized uh, electrostatic sprayers where we could do school buses uh, with one cartridge that's like 4,000 square feet. So those types of things, because we know it's going to be hard to find extra employees. So whatever we could do to make it easier 
and quicker for us to you know, sanitize the building is the angle that we're taking at this. Okay, thank you. And something questions? to go back to, it just popped into my head, I apologize, is the first tier or the first assessment, it should be the parent or the guardian who assesses the student at home. Okay, that's the first assessment. First line of prevention and I think we have to have also look into it as it goes forward what kind of policy we have when we do have an issue that it's you know because I mean this is a, we're in a different world but parents tend to because of issues at home send kids to school and if they do then you know then we have to get them back and I mean there's got to be a, a you know I think some real issues addressed to our parents and our students of what we're gonna do equally to everybody because I mean to have two or three students isolated in a school could be catastrophic if that goes on every day. Well, and that's where the communication, that's where the communication piece is gonna be very vital. We have to communicate to our parents, to our staff, what our policies and guidelines are before school starts mm -hmm. and just keep reminding them throughout the school year so that in the beginning you develop multiple emergency contacts. You have a plan A, you have a plan B as a parent or a guardian. Uh, so I think that, yes, it's very, very important that we have clear communication to and parents. be able to contact staff. and just know the apologies because I think it's gonna be a, and the other thing, and I'll, probably, I'll say this at the end, maybe it's premature now, all these numbers we're seeing, we should, send them both to the state if we can and the county because if there's any money available for COVID-19 you know this is a I mean there's going to be additional cost for us to open up school this fall and if the county has any money or the state has any money which we've already done some I think you know we be ahead of the curve and let this know it's coming because it's I can just see this yeah we, we, we um when we have access to funds then that's where we it would do us little good to just send them our needs um, because they wouldn't be able to just take care of that. But when we have access to funds like the CARES dollars and then the GEARS dollars that we just talked about um, a little earlier and we'll mention a little bit later today, those are those opportunities. And then with the county as well. Let me just put the county, let them see these numbers because mm -hmm. they have money which they need for their issues. But you know, we're opening up 8,000 students coming in on a, every day or every other day. Uh, and there's buildings locked down in the county all the time. So getting back to the communication piece, and, and Mr. Pluski can t speak to this, it would be beneficial to have it in our student handbook, you know, handing it to them. I mean, and then having the protocol, you know, health protocol guidelines. That way there's no, mm -hmm. you know, here's, here's how we are taking care of this and there's no, no surprises. Yes, and I can correct. We're that's part of the plan. That. Mm -hmm. right that is a recommendation. Our parent, our parent student handbook. Uh, okay. So we're working on the prepare. Once these guidelines become final, then that becomes a guiding document. That's always good. Right. right. There's there's so. lots of information available. There's lots in in multiple languages. There's public service announcements that can be broadcast as well. We can utilize social social media forums. Okay. That's great. It's a blitz. It's going to be a blitz. You will probably are learning it from the principals there. You know, there are existing policies. For example, you get a call, the kid comes in to the nurse's office, I always get a call. I analyze with the kid, are you just trying to get out of class? Or, you know, I mean, some of that goes on. But they're not going to have time for all this. If a kid shows up with a certain problem, the parent's going to have to pick them up. I mean, I, mean, I, I see that, that. This is an unusual situation. Those kinds of things are changes that we aren't used to mm -hmm. so they would have to be emphasized probably even more than just a student handbook because a lot of people don't read that whole thing well and our so. basic policies and procedures may need to change a little bit and just to give you one example the policy and, and I'm you know I'm exaggerating numbers but the policy as it stands now is they have to be fever free for so many hours the new policy might be okay not only do you have to be fever free for X amount of more hours or X amount of more days, but you also have to be symptom free. So no cough, no shortness of breath, no difficulty breathing. Whereas pre COVID, right. you might've been able to come back sure. to school, you know, after being fever free for 48 hours with no medication to mask the fever and still show up with an active cough. So those are the little nuances that have to be very clearly written so that the parents do have clear communication. True. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I actually have a question and I don't know if this is the team to answer it. The Elementary school, the AB, AB days, I get how that can work, but these kids who change classes, you couldn't possibly divide it by alphabet or because you don't know who's going to be in this algebra class or that. So how do you even start? 
think that's team, team two. That's a different team two. <laughs> talk to you next. Yes. All right. Thank but you. Get a big enough team. <laughs> Escape quickly. Thank you so much. We appreciate Thank you. you. Thanks for coming in. Uh, it's nice I think to see the you. Next group is, unless I'm just looking at somebody else, it's Social ready to go. How many groups? Yes. Yeah. Pullen, would you yeah, get down just real we quick? We have kind of spaced okay. out. Yeah, Use the clock, please. Miss Miss Pullen. Yeah. Pullen, can you just or Miss Fowlers, can you just wipe that oh, down? Oh, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll have a glimpse of what they did to plan the invasion of Normandy. <laughs> I might get in trouble for. It's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what's permitted for the electrical equipment. I don't want to get in trouble for that. <laughs> Recognize these first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, Mr. Tolly and Ms. Welch. Long time to see. Yes. I told you we'd be back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, you'll have to advance that. There you go. So team two. All right, so uh, team two had the responsibility of looking at continuity of uh, teaching and learning. And um, so we're gonna share our recommendations. So the potential scenarios that we have uh, are three different ones. Complete distance learning for all students, if we must. Uh, we're gonna talk about a few hybrid models which would combine face-to-face -face and distance learning uh, following uh, the procedures that um, you just heard about. And then um, in a perfect world, uh, complete face-to-face -face learning for all students, which doesn't seem like it's gonna be really possible right now, but we hope to get there soon. So looking at the an elementary hybrid model, option one, this would be an A day, B day. Um, the student population would be divided into two cohort groups, A and B. Uh, group A would attend school in person on Mondays and Thursdays. The group B cohort would attend school in person on Tuesdays and Fridays. And then on Wednesdays, everybody would be virtual. All students would participate in distance learning with an abbreviated schedule to allow teachers time for collaborative planning and professional development. And then custodial staff would use this day to clean and sanitize uh, the buildings. Um, we do have a, a concern and uh, this crosses over kind of back into team one with transportation about the ability to transport this number of students safely following CDC guidelines, but we think we can do it if we can get one in every seat. Um, however, this would not be a viable option for mill and high schools due to their scheduling needs, um, but it would be an option for elementary. Another elementary hybrid model um, would use a, a, a similar um, plan, but it would be AABB days. So a student population, again, would be divided into two cohort groups, A and B. Group A would attend school in person on Mondays and Tuesdays, on back-to-back -back days. Group B would attend school in person Thursdays and Fridays. Again, we would leave Wednesday for deep cleaning and sanitizing, and all students would participate in distance learning with an abbreviated schedule. Um, this option does reduce the transition of cohort groups, which um, does seem uh, a good, good idea health-wise. Uh, again, this is not a viable option for our middle and high schools due to scheduling needs and also transportation because these two options would pretty much max out the transportation that we have available to us uh, with the current buses. So with the secondary levels looking at um, recommendation to send elementary back on the A day B day schedule, uh, like Ms. Uh, Welch mentioned, it's, it's very difficult to add secondary in there as well if we are going to be using the buses at half or less capacity depending on the guidelines from CDC, then those buses are going to be maxed out and we would not be able to add the rotation in for middle and high school. So the, the recommendation that we came up with, with be that middle and high school would stay with distance learning uh, to start the school year. And again, this is you know based on the information that we have at hand now, um, and we just try to make the best uh, judgment as, as possible. Um, with regard to CTE, so if the general school population would not be going back um, just within the um, CTE meetings that we have had, um, which have been several since our, our close down in March, there has obviously been um, 
many concerns raised about the the skills gap that is, exists between you know the uh, really really with our trades programs within CTE. Um, a lot of the other programs that we have that are CTE uh, can can function in a distance learning environment such as computer science, interactive media. But when you look at our um, courses that we have listed here, auto tech, carpentry, masonry, cosmetology, nursing, welding, those are the the, the hands-on courses and those students um, we we feel really need to be able to get some kind of of face-to-face -face instruction um, so that they're, they're able to you know acquire their skills we're looking at you know we address that back in the uh, the parent survey with regard to the skills gap and and that's certainly a concern so we would want to get these students in here and this is just a a sample uh, what a schedule could possibly look like for those students uh, in CT courses, and it's it's basically the same uh, principle as elementary, an A A day B day or could be the A A uh, B B day, and you would basically split a course up in half. So if we have 20 students, which is is typically an average for our CTE, we would split those up, 10 students on A day one, 10 students on A day B, and then and then rotate out, and we feel that. Uh, just getting you know some face-to-face -face interaction, getting those skills, being able to prepare those students for their um, industry certifications is is very critical. So we definitely wanted to to put that in there. And, and again, this would be on an abbreviated day, so it wouldn't be a full day because we still have to give teachers opportunity uh, to prepare and to address their learners that are at home. So it's it's not just a a one and and none so we are still we still have learners that are at home so we still need to you know consider the the teachers time and be being able to give them um, time to, to address those learners as well so across either uh, of the plans that we have we in from the information we have from parents as well as from staff member input we know that um, we need consistency for distance learning um, we, our team discussed having expectations for a minimum number of online, live, or synchronous teaching sessions. Um, elementary, uh, the recommendation was at least three to four times per week. Um, secondary, one to two per course. Um, and if we are, especially if we do have to be all virtual online, um, we really need to set schedules for online sessions to mitigate connectivity issues. Um, looking at elementary earlier in the day, uh, high school midday, and middle school later in the afternoon. Um, and then the team uh, wants to consider a procedure to safely collect those paper learning packets to be returned to teachers, um, uh, which we have not been able to do, but we understand that some families are just gonna need that paper packet and we need a procedure to safely collect those. Any questions? Just one more slide we've got. Oh, okay. sorry. And just the you know just the, the the rough idea for budget implications. So the the online environment, as you guys have been briefed before, with the LMS in in Schoology is is definitely uh, something that is essential to uh, successful online learning. So that that is put in there as uh, as a budget cost, and then the the professional development that teachers are going to need for. Um, being able to, to teach effectively online, to be able to um, look at certain things. You know, we looked at the building relationships, how to do that in a virtual environment. So those, those items definitely come in, which is, uh, you know, accounts for our budget of $100,000 here. I, I don't Questions. understand that. We've already talked about all that. We've funded the LMS. Yeah, and what the point is, is that it's an ongoing expense, but we know that it's gonna be in the operating budget. What we asked each team to do was to put any fiscal implication, and if we've covered it, we're good. We just okay. wanna put out there what the um, the implications are. Dr. Tully, I worry about the CTE students. So what if the cohort only has 10 to 15 students? Are they allowed to all to come at one time? Be socially distanced, like the carpentry students? Absolutely. That class only had, what, eight to 10 students in it? Yes. So could they comfortably, you know, safely go into that area and, and do their projects? Yes, I think so. You know, based on the, the latest recommendation we have of being able to allow 10 to 15 in. So, and it would just depend on, you know, what our numbers look like now. We just have finished up with uh, enrollment uh, for next year. So it's definitely possible to, to allow them all to come in and then we could adjust based on that. But, it, but then again, it also, um, you know, we talked about transportation. That is a, an issue as well, because if you look at the number of students that have to be transported, so you have to balance the number of students that are transported versus those that, that come in a car. 
So there's going to be a lot of work to to actually looking at these schedules, you know, especially with elementary, a full elementary, but even the, you know, and, and I just estimated roughly 140 students for CTE, but even with those 140, you're looking at just balancing the schedules and, and moving students around, and, and it becomes even more difficult when you have students that are, you know, in certain programs, basic carpentry, advanced carpentry, et cetera. And they still have to take their English, their history, their social studies, and, and, and yes. government, whatever. So to accommodate their classroom in the afternoons, yes, I understand. But I was thinking the nursing students and the cosmetology students, there may only be 10 students in there, and they can be reasonably um, in that space. Absolutely, and the spaces so. will accommodate that. And I've talked to some of, some of my instructors about that, and especially with uh, some of the, the outside environments that we have, carpentry, for example, there's, there's room to, to space them out safely. Okay. What about cosmetology? Yeah. That requires an enormous amount of supervised training just to get a certificate. And the stations that I saw were rest relatively close together. And that would be, and that's, you know, typically a program that is, is at capacity. So that would certainly be one of those programs that we would that we would operate on the, the A B day. A, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it is, it's, it's a very intensive program as far as the hours go. And, and um, you know, we've had several meetings regarding that. And, you know, we're, we are bound to the, the recommendations by, and the requirements by the Maryland uh, Board of Cosmetology. So, right. you know, we have, to, we have to play by their rules and, and be able to do it within our environment. So it's, it's, it's certainly not easy. There hasn't been a, a one easy answer for CTE, but, you know. It's a challenge, but I think we'll be successful. Thank I think you. so. Right. Any other so. questions? I have questions. I yeah, go ahead. So your, your A, B dates. So if I'm an A student, on B day, am I logging in to watch class, or is B day learning the same thing I learned yesterday? That's a good question. Our, our hope is that there could be a time when it is synchronous, when you are logging in. However, we realize that that might not always be possible. Mm -hmm. So it may be that the teacher's doing the direct instruction support kind of some pre-teaching to get them ready to do what they're going to do on their distance learning days. Okay. Um, at, at best, it gets them back in front of face-to-face, -face, you know, with teachers for um, an increased amount of time. Um, but you're exactly right. There's the potential there to do some synchronous instruction where you have 10 or 12 kids at home, 10 kids, mm -hmm. you know, in the room, and you could potentially have some conversations back and forth and have some synchronous instruction going on. Because the concern there is if, if we're not trying to do that, then you're slowing the pace of what they're learning this semester. So they're not picking up as much as they would have Correct. five days a week. And then back to the high school question, how you decide what 50% is. I mean, you can't split it by alphabet. You can still have a full algebra class, but like two kids in Spanish. So how do you decide who your A-day kids day are? Well, at this point, the, so that that face-to-face -face for high school would just be limited to CTE and, and maybe our special population. So the, the, the general courses, those students would be completely okay. distance learning. Okay, because yeah. you're exactly right. With that master schedule, once you pull one, once you move one piece of it, it messes the rest of it up. So it really does not work with, definitely with high school and even with middle school, with that rotating moving schedule where they move through periods, it, it doesn't, fit very neatly into an A day, B day schedule, unfortunately. So would you still pull all your teachers in and they'd be teaching in the classroom to the camera and possibly There's the potential teaching? for that. We did have uh, several staff members in, in the, uh, um, the report that want to be able to teach from their classroom. They felt like that would be, um, you know, beneficial for them to, to have the materials and have, have things like that in front of them. So there's the potential for that to happen, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other right. questions? I'm very disappointed we have to go to all distance learning in high school and middle school. So am I. So it doesn't work. So I don't know what we're going to do because, in my opinion, kids are not going to be learning enough. So I guess my concern is we've got to be heavily engaged with the teachers physically seeing these kids. You know, I have teachers that didn't do Zoom or anything. Well, and this is why, you're exactly right, and this is why we really want the consistency in expectations a across the board. Um, I'm a high school mom, too, and yes. um, very concerned. You know, that's not what I, why I'm speaking here tonight, but I am concerned about that. Um, but we really felt the need for consistency and expectations across 
um, across the board for how many interactive meets should you be having. And the parents spoke loud and clear um, that that was what was making a difference for their children, were the Google Meets or the um, even a videotaped lesson by the teacher, not necessarily Khan Academy, although there's a place and time for that, but their teacher who they have a relationship with teaching them. So there's no way you guys could figure out how to have the kid face to face with the teacher mm -hmm. in, in, in person. Not in not a rotating schedule for high school, no. Not without because there a are lot kids more buses. that cannot do it that yes, way. Yes, I understand. That. It's it's impossible. So I'm but very disappointed. Not. Um, and not your fault. I just wish there was a way. Did it's you have me. did you have students on your t tiger team? Did you have teachers on your Tiger team? We had, we had teachers, no, no students on the Tiger were team. On that but, but a lot of parents, and, and I'm a parent of a high school student as well, and, and many of the uh, the members of our team, you know, we, there was a lot of discussion. We had a lot of rich discussion over this, and, um, you know, we we would love to be able to do it. And, and I, I feel the same way. I, I think the engagement piece, and we saw that in the parent survey, the, it's, it's crucial. It really is. Um, but just the, the logistics when we start to look at this and, and being able to, um, you know, with the buses that we have, I believe 70, 73 buses or so, to be able to, to do that with all three levels is just, it's, it's virtually impossible. It looks Sorry. like we don't have to worry about the, all these 14 buildings if the kids aren't going to be in them. No one's going to be in the middle school buildings. They'll be only in the CTE classrooms. So we're not going to have that big cost in all these buildings. It's something that's coming up. But besides huh? CT, I think you really need to look at your, your high, higher level disability student mm -hmm. because they are not successful with the virtual. I mean, I, I can tell you my student, she couldn't see the screen, so it sure. didn't do her any good. Sure. Um, but I understand the different levels of disability. Some of those kids are in her, yes. going in and out of that classroom, and some can't. Absolutely. Right. So I, is there a chance that you could be bringing some of those kids back in, but the kids who don't change classes stay in this classroom all day? It, it is a possibility it, that the special populations that we, that we mentioned, so it could be our, our EL learners. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, a, the groups that we have to look at and see and, and kind of prioritize to see who we really need to get back in. Okay. Surprisingly, it's, it's, not, it's not just the parents who feel like they need the interaction. I mean, I have an upcoming ninth grader, and... As much as I thought he would like the virtual learning, he would prefer to be in the classroom Absolutely. because he feels like he's losing something. Absolutely. They are social beings. Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. That's exactly that's what I feel for the kids, the socialization of being with their peers. Also, the whole high school experience. There, there's, it's a rite of passage to be in high school and to be, you know, become a sophomore, a junior, a senior. You know? So I, I feel for them for mi missing out on um, the social interaction piece I mean, Absolutely. besides Neighbors. the learning. There's good news. We had three months of learning about how this worked and where the pitfalls were. So part of this complex plan is going to lift up uh, by solving some of the problems we discovered. You know, already seeing what I've seen, this is a very well thought out situation. And you're going to hear more. Thank yeah. you for that. And you're going to hear more about expectations for, for teachers um, as well as expectations for students as we continue with our Tiger Team report. So that is a part of the plan. Um, and what we do have to continue to communicate is what we did in the spring is not what we're going to do as we move forward for the next school year. That was an emergency situation. We have the benefit, thank you, Mr. Anderson, of some months of having done what we did, learning from what we've done, understanding what parents would like, um, and so and, and what's going to work in our schools from a health standpoint. So there's a lot of work that has been done. There will continue to be work that's being done. And as the governor release, you know, um, lifts restrictions, then we'll continue to continue to bring students back. We always have those days when we will have groups of students, small groups with high needs, CTE labs, and those kinds of things that we can't get away from that face-to-face -face, um, interaction. So that will continue as well. And, and our teachers on the team, I mean, they have, they have already been, in, in our discussions on the team, they were already thinking and, and planning and figuring out how to make this work because they, they really want, you know, what is best for students and just, with some of my social studies teachers, they've always been talking about collaboration and different things that they can do to be prepared for whatever situation That's you know right. comes up. And the, in, as as Miss Welch mentioned earlier, this, as we all know, is fluid. It could change at any minute. But you know, I think that we're going to be prepared for whatever comes at us. Yeah, I agree. I've, I've said all along that this is a moving target for the fall. 
and all we need is for that target just to slow down just a little bit and our teachers will take care of it. I have no doubt once we give them a directive, this is what we're gonna do. We I should be thinking about it. consolidating buildings too. I mean, there's no reason. I mean, you could probably have the CTE issue all at Queen Anne's County High School. And you know, I don't think you, you got a lot of empty buildings, which is, I mean, that's advantageous for cleaning and for feeding and everything if you're not gonna do middle school. So I-, I and, and there will still be groups of students that are pulled. So the buildings, there will be no empty buildings, um, but there'll still be groups of students that are pulled. Why would there be no empty buildings? Be because they're, they, they, why would there be if we're pulling groups of students? We would still have some special populations that we could serve, um, especially those students who are in a um, full day self-contained special ed classroom, which I think is kind of what we were talking about before. Um, those students we may be able to, to serve. And um, so there wouldn't be completely empty buildings. We still have the potential also for the teachers to be teaching from their, their teaching spaces. So, but you're right, it probably okay. is gonna be a cost savings for utilities at least because we're not going the to be feeding, having a full the building. The feeding process, we just got briefed on that. That's yeah. not gonna have to exist. Well, we still, still have, have to feed, feed students. Yeah. We still have to feed them, yeah. Okay. It's, well, it's our adaptability to all this is what's going to be key. You know, but I just hope we don't speaking. lose sight of the general population. I think we, you all hit on this. The general students, they want to be involved and they need interaction with their teachers and their peers. If it's, and I don't know what it could be right now, it might not be possible, but if it's one day, two days, one day a month, two days a month, just somewhere, because I think interaction socially, because I think as they get through life, they can learn whatever they want, but if they can't get along with people and can't understand communications, that's what it's all about. And I think when we, st when we start talking middle school students and high school students, they need that interaction. I mean, they, they can be home with their parents, they can do this, but they need their interaction with their other friends, teachers, and other people that they look to. And I think that's something we cannot lose sight of. And I don't think we have. I mean, sure. I know you're planning for this and it's been well done. What can we do to, under these circumstances, and you're right, not that I hear this all the time, it changes not on a daily basis, but on an hourly basis. But I really yeah. want to make sure we don't let anybody and our general population, because it's, it's going to be a, a learning experience for all of us this year. Sure is. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, much. very much. Wipe down a little bit, team three. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. It's team three, accountability, grading, and reporting. Yep, right up front and center. Welcome, Ms. Carey. Ms. Carey is um, one of the project managers for team three, along with Julie Forbes. Uh, Ms. Carey is the principal of Kennard Elementary, and Ms. Forbes, as you know, supervisor for accountability, assessment, and data management. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here. And she couldn't be with us um, this evening because she's on vacation, so. Um, Lucky her. All right. Okay, so we have the pleasure of um, assessment, grading, and reporting um, attendance. Um, we had a phenomenal team, actually. It was very well represented with elementary, middle, high school um, specialists, so as were all the other teams. Um, we really felt like, generally speaking, um, our policies and procedures for grading and reporting um, really could align with any of the schedules or models that we have already presented, um, team two. So for elementary, um, we felt like we could still keep with the trimester um, and our rubrics of scoring for the 4321. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at this before we even moved into what the fall could potentially look like and it worked pretty well um, for us at the elementary level. Um, mastery of content with specific minimum and maximum work submission would still be um, very doable. Our formative and summative assessments, we also felt like we could administer those. And with um, the purchase of the new LMS, that also really lends itself to being able to do that, um, whether it's virtually or with the, the um, second schedule, the AA schedule. Um, for middle school, um, same thing. They're on a quarter um, scoring, reporting, grading and reporting. And we felt like, again, 
we could um, cont continue with the established percentages for the new content learned with um, the GPAs from PowerSchool and the entry of, of grades um, from the, the classroom teachers would still work for us as well. Um, for high school, um, grading policy and procedures will also, we are recommending those remain the same. Um, we, I kind of highlighted, we highlighted all of the, the specific things that are, that are actually coming from the policies and procedures um, so that we didn't have to go through all of those. Those documents are pretty lengthy. Um, and you can refer to the high school grading policy for that. Year-long courses and semester courses, we felt like um, we would still be able to um, look at that, administer the exams. Um, test security was a big topic of conversation for us. And um, between Julie and I and our team, we really felt like test security would be taken into consideration. And, and we could look at that, again, with the new LMS system. That's going to be very, very feasible. Um, we would still have the final grades. And again, just based on our policies and procedures, no student would be exempt um, from these examinations unless it was um, approved by the academic dean and principal. Um, our second set of recommendations um, fall under local assessments. Um, depending on what our schedule looks like at the beginning of the year, um, we felt like for distance learning environment, all of our local assessments could still be administered remotely. Um, if we went into the hybrid learning environment, all of our diagnostic assessments for um, ELA, English language arts and math, um, we could potentially do an in-person um, administration. And then we felt like the other three, the benchmark, the midterm and the final exams could be done um, remote or in person. Um, we also had conversations about um, the technology and whether we had students um, who wouldn't have access. Um, our goal, obviously, is to have everybody have access to the technology, you know, 100%. Um, but if we had some something of the hybrid, we could really accommodate our, our kiddos um, with small numbers. Um, remote administration security measures, again, um, we have features where we can lock down um, the Performance Matters uh -huh. browser. Um, testing windows will be des designated just as we normally would um, the testing calendar for the school year. Um, signed agreement um, between students, parents, and guardians. We felt like kind of the honor system of <laughs> what that's going to look like would be, would be key. State assessments, that's still to be determined by MSD. So much of, of that planning is going to be contingent upon what they decide um, as far as that goes. Attendance, um, I know Mr. Um, um, Matt Evans is going to speak to this. So we did collaborate with him since student support and attendance falls under um, his, his um, area. But we thought, we thought codes in power school to indicate if a student is distance learning or attending in person um, would be very, very easy for us to do in power school. That wouldn't be anything different as far as what we do for coding of attendance um, currently. Um, <coughs> enrollment, um, we're going to continue with our SNAP codes and we're already in the midst of that right now. I know our percentages for our parents um, enrolling their students look really, really um, great at this point. So our parents are pretty used to, to enrolling our students and completing those school forms. So um, this is my favorite slide. Mr. Fisters too. <laughs> no, because Mr. Dick's looking at it like dun, great. Dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. We have no budget implications <laughs> for any of those items. So <laughs> my favorite slide. Yes. We were happy to it's fill our that favorite one out. Favorite slide. It's everybody's favorite slide. Yes, absolutely. We so, should applaud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question. Sure. If nobody else wants to start, the formative and summative assessments <coughs> in elementary schools, uh, students. Um, how, how just. Only in person, uh, how, with the yep. virtual learning, I mean. Actually, a lot of our schools are already doing a lot of their formatives online okay. um, through, we were using Unify, so a lot of our kiddos are already used to, to using those platforms. Unify? Mm -hmm. Okay. We were doing some of our, our um, formative assessments, so we have kind of rolled a lot of that out over the past few years, so. Um, and okay. with Google Classroom, um, and even the alignment with the LMS, I. I feel like a lot of the same features are there. A lot of our students are pretty well equipped. Um, you know, our third graders, they're used to taking those formatives, you know, the quick exit slips, um, exit tickets on Google Classroom. I was thinking more of like the, the first, the kindergartners and first graders. I mean, do we, how, how are they adapting? Well, I know they're going to speak to it in the technology, the technology okay. piece um, okay. and the tools that they're um, providing for some of those younger ones. Okay, great. Thank you.
Anyone else? On your slide the, um, 34, you have hybrid learning environment. Were you just talking about elementary there? In this one? No, the hybrid was for the, like the AA schedule, the B. So we were taking into consideration if we went all virtual or a hybrid type. So the, okay. Yes, some virtual, some face-to-face -face is a hybrid. Because you've got down here remote administration of the midterms, but in-person administration on finals. So this is, this is not the high schools and the middle school, right? because we're not gonna do anything in person, is what I understand, is that right? This one is for, that would, because we don't do final exams in elementary school, so this is for, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that is for um, high school students. I don't, that last I don't understand what, I don't understand what that is then. Um, do you want me to go back to that? Or the, I'm sorry, slide 34. So uh, the, the students could go to, to the schools to do in-person final exams. Is that what they're saying? What I they're don't saying? know. That, that's, that's the way I interpret this. Yes. Just smaller groups. Mm -hmm. Smaller groups. They could take their A, B days of... I and mean, we, I'm we just can, guessing. We can certainly pull Miss... Um, Ms. Welch and Mr. Tolley back in, and I know you collaborated with them, but that is the way I understood it when we've been meeting. Right. Okay. Yes. All right. Any other we'll, we'll clarify further yeah, for you as well. Mm -hmm. Even for college classes, if you've got the same group taking it two different days, you just have two different tests, so you don't have right. the questions leaking out there. Correct. There are some assessments that they certainly can take, um, you know, at home virtually, but there, are, I know that there are some that they want to have in face to face. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. If you do a quick Thank wipe you. down right there, we will call in team four. Enjoy July. August is coming. <laughs> I can't believe it's Mr. Pluski likes to remind us quickly. It's <laughs> August is coming. And so the next team, um, team Tiger Team Four, they did a lot of work on social emotional um, learning, social emotional support. Um, don't want to steal their thunder, but we've been having a lot of conversations about how to prepare for our students once they return in light of, yes, COVID, in light of being home and uh, without those social interactions and also in light of the um, uh, state of our, our our country in terms of racism and Black Lives Matter and all of those kinds of things. So thanks to Mr. Evans and, and Ms. Chambers, who is not here tonight. Um, you're on. Okay. Uh, good evening, board members. Good evening, Dr. Kane. My name is Matt Evans, a supervisor of student services. Uh, we were uh, in charge of the social and emotional support, Tiger Team 4. Um, I just have a few slides with some, some pretty important recommendations. Um, we, we really thought it was important not to just make this a one and done sort of deal um, where we're providing some, some basic training and letting it go. So we first thing the team really wanted to make sure was that each school incorporated social and emotional learning into their school improvement plan. So that would be an ongoing thing where they're receiving development and, uh, and they're accountable really each, each school year. Um, but looking, and, and, and the SEL has actually been a big push even pre-COVID statewide and nationally. So we were already kind of moving towards a lot of this. But really what our team thought was important, um, first we want to train all staff members, classroom teachers in, in what's called ACES. We have uh, four master trainers uh, uh, in-house that have been trained to do this. So, so we can do that and we can do it virtually. Um, I think Google Meets has at least 150 participants on at a time. And the big piece about the aversive childhood experiences is, is it focuses on, on trauma and how trauma affects the brain. And certainly students have, have experienced trauma during this closure, um, the separation from their peers, their teachers. Um, but it really focuses, it plants the seed for adults to understand that sometimes students, you know, are the reason, or at least how the trauma affects learning and affects their behavior. So we want to plant that seed so that they kind of um, understand that with their students and also kind of within themselves. The next piece that you see is the zones of regulation. So what we would have, and that actually has been implemented at Bayside Elementary School last year. That is really a tool, once the, the teachers kind of understand and have that mindset, that's the tool that they can give to the students where um, they're teaching them and giving them the, the skill set to, to regulate their emotions, to regulate their behavior. Mm -hmm. So that, because um, we, we all, um, you know, have different emotional experiences and, and some of us have better skill sets than others. So it's important to, 
to discuss this with students so that, and, and the payoff, the idea is the payoff will be big in the end because if it's not available to learn, then, um, you know, if, if those sort of emotions are blocking it, they're not, they're not going to be available to learn. So um, a big piece of that too is we want to have an SEL team for each school. Uh, we already have school climate teams in all of our schools. Um, this would really would be incorporated into that, but that would also help with the fact that it's on the um, school improvement plan. Also, just providing ongoing professional development for staff and faculty meetings throughout the year. Um, a piece of this is uh, at the elementary level, it, it's not going to be difficult rolling this out. I think in having these conversations with students once the teachers are changed or are trained, but at the secondary level, it's going to be more challenging. And so we may have to adjust the, the master schedule to include uh, an advisory period or morning meetings because um, we have to carve out some time and dedicate it to this because we, our team really did feel that it was that important. Um, Looking at, at, at when we do open up, um, if we are in a hybrid in some way, or even if we're fully back and it's going to look a little different, we were thinking we should create some sort of virtual tour that, so that students, some students have never been in the buildings. We're going to have new, new students, mm -hmm. but so they understand if we're spaced out what it's going to look like so they can see some faces, uh, et cetera, just so they have a visual before they're coming in. Um, we, our team thought that would be important. Of course, we would do that at, for the elementary, middle, and high. Um, and we just really felt that this, the first two weeks, and that includes the, the teacher training, but even the first week back with students, we have to address that elephant in the room. I mean, we, we shut down. Nobody got to say goodbye. They haven't seen their friends. They haven't seen the teachers. So it's important to start off the year focusing on that, making them feel safe, having them understand that, you know, we're going to address this piece and know that they always have an outlet if they need it so that they, they do feel safe and are able to move forward with learning. Um, part of that SEL team is also going to um, serve staff members, self-care resources for and guidance for all staff. There's, and I found out there's a lot of benefits that we have that are free to us that, that we dug up through HR that we want to make sure we communicate to staff members. And even in faculty meetings for doing some mindfulness activities or yoga, things like that, but have them give them the resources they need because staff members have been stressed out through all this. You know, this is, this is not what most teachers signed up for. So um, our team felt that was important as well. Regarding family supports, um, we, we did have the question in, in the parent survey about you know, what social emotional supports they thought were most important for, for their child. So we did get good data back on that. But that, that communication will be ongoing because we're going to want parents to let us know, as, particularly if we're in a distance learning environment or even a hybrid, you know, what, what sort of things are working and, and what things they might need help with. Um, and if we are in, in a distance learning environment, we want to give these SEL skills to parents for them to practice with their, with their students at home, strategy cards for parents that will help alleviate stress and anxiety, um, and possibly even provide sample schedules, because sometimes they, I think that was a challenging piece was, you know, students just kind of went home, they weren't on a, a, a routine schedule anymore, and then that created problems. So we might, you know, provide sample schedules for parents that they can try and incorporate. Um, Group and individual counseling for students, that did continue after the school closures. We partnered with, with external providers. That did continue. It started off in a, in a teletherapy short, sort of way, but they did have them coming in the, um, the offices as well. We, we also, we continued with some social skills groups from our in-house staff that we were doing with students, which uh, was really working out well and was really well received, and they even expanded it. And there was uh, some groups that were newly formed, and, and from my understanding, they're still kind of interacting with each other now, so they got a lot, at, a lot out of that. And uh, so we, we want to expand that with the, um, the school-based counseling, both from external providers, but also uh, in-house, and, and make sure that's happening virtually if need be, if, if that's the, the, the situation we're in. Um, of course, we, we had to do this this year, an attendance code that shows that students are present, but they're not in the building. So we may have a hybrid schedule or, or a student that, you know, a family that doesn't feel comfortable sending their child back and maybe they're completely on distance learning, but they are engaging. So we, we want to count them present, but we also need to show that they're actually not physically in our building. Right now we have a code, we just put DL for distance learning. Um, and as of March 30th from this year, all of our students were coded as DL to show that they were present, but they were not in the building. 
Um, finally, ultimately we want to provide Gmail accounts for all parents to ensure so that they can connect with our, our, our learning management system to, that uh, I believe we are, are moving forward with. Um, and I know certainly for our, our younger students, it's important for those parents to have those, those Gmail accounts so they can access. Um, as far as the budget, um, as I said, we, we felt the, uh, the SEL team was important to have in, in order to keep that going and do it with fidelity. They should meet monthly, um, and they would need to do that before or after school hours. So uh, I put in there one hour per month for five team members for 10 months for all 15 schools. Um, we have, when I talked about our, our ACE, our master ACE trainers, two of them are PPWs, which are 11 month employees, but the other two are mental health coordinators, which are 10 month employees. And we do want them to, there are certain things that they're required to present in that, but we do want them to tailor it somewhat to, um, you know, COVID and some of the trauma that has come from that. So asking for one full day for each of the 10 month employees to plan so we can roll that out when the teachers return in August. Um, and finally, the uh, zones of regulation that I discussed, um, really it's a resource book, one for each school so that we can, um, so teachers have resources and, and uh, lessons, things like that, that they're able to use within the classroom. That is what I have. Are there any questions? I had a question about um, offering teletherapy for our teachers. Um, do we have that available? There, there actually is, I think you have five times where you can, for free, make, but it's not necessarily visual, but you can make, you can call places. But that's that's important, I think, for us to get out to our teachers, because I wasn't even aware that was a benefit that we had. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great thing. And this mental health coordinators, they, they, who, the, who is the training they go to? Just a PD day that they present at each school? So they would do more than one school at a time because okay. um, it's going to be tight um, for, right. for PD and training. But like I said, we have four that are master trainers, so they would kind of split up. And I mean, we could maybe have two of them do two two faculties at a time. They're, the plan is to do two 45-minute sessions, so it's not like it's an all-day thing. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, who do the team members... Uh, when they engage with a student, here's something that requires referral. How does that work? When you say team members? Well, like the SELs. So, so that would be a team that would be representative of the school staff. You probably have a school psychologist, school counselor, a teacher who's passionate about that, and they would plan, and they would provide, I guess, um, training and skills to classroom teachers. So if there was a situation they recognized, you know, the, the proper referral process to the counselor going forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank I got a, a great, Mr. Um, Evans and Ms. Chambers have um, provided a wealth of resources and another great webinar, a seat at the table, um, Zaretta Hammond and talking about how uh, these circumstances that we're under right now impacts the brain um, and, and learning. So learning by design and how it impacts the brain. So that's another great resource I'll share it with you. Thank you. So for any of our teachers, educators, parents who are listening, you might want to plug into that, a seat at the table. Zaretta Hammond, outstanding work. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Have a good July you month well. off. All right, and um, as Mr. Evans wipes down the table, we will prepare for Tiger Team 5. That is the technology and connectivity team, and um, that's going to be with Ms. Farnell, Teresa Farnell, our principal at Centerville Elementary School, and with Josh Combs. And of course, you know Mr. Combs is the supervisor for technology. On cue. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Josh Combs. I'm the supervisor of technology. I'm, I'm Teresa Farnell, the principal of Centerville Elementary School. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, thanks for coming. Okay, our first slide talks about connectivity and access. Uh, we've already started by putting outdoor wireless access points. 
We have them in five schools right now, and the plan is to install another nine, basically every building. We'll have an access point for it, our students and staff to be able to connect in the parking lots with our devices. And the, the county's being really gracious about helping us make that happen. Um, they're also looking at, for the public, putting also Atlantic Broadband access points as well. So during conditions like this, even the public would have access to the internet at the school locations. We will continue use of the MiFi personal hotspots, um, little Verizon wireless hotspots that we'll be giving students that don't have internet at home, that um, it works inside their home. I mean, unfortunately, it's not all Specialization, depending on where you live, these, these devices might not work out, but we're trying every option that we can afford to get internet in as many homes as possible. Um, we've also created uh, Google accounts for our pre-K to second grade students. And what those Google accounts um, include are student email accounts and uh, passwords. Um, and they will be able to be used um, if we go back to distance learning or anything like that, the parents, it'll be easier for the parents to be able to log in using their child's Gmail account and password on a county device or on their home device uh, to use. Um, they'll also be available if any of our parents are interested in doing the universal summer learning opportunity through Exact Path. They have that opportunity to use their students' um, Gmail account and password. And if they're interested, um, principals at different schools will be sending out that information to parents who are interested for that, so. Uh, one of the things we were also tasked with was creating guidelines for collection and redistribution of student devices over the summer. Um, for the most part, students were able to keep their devices um, so they have access something to use for the summer programs. It could be Exact Path, uh, at Montum, there's, there's several summer learning, universal migration. So what we did was, anybody that need, Cornbrook was damaged and was in need of repair, uh, week of June 15th, we went ahead and collected them. And if we had a loaner, because they needed for a summer program, we gave them a loaner. Um, some of them, if they had a personal device and made them feel comfortable with keeping the Chromebook over the summer, we asked, We'll go ahead and collect those. And, um, and if a student was not participating, we would also collect those. But for the most part, I think the, the students have collected there and, and gives a chance to at least get a jump on fixing any damage crumble <coughs> maybe got damaged over the two months while they were at home uh, with the online learning. We're asking that on the week of August 3rd, that students that are in possession of a Chromebook and are in a transitional grade level to be collected. Uh, the reason for this is Chromebooks were given to a school. So an example, say Sellers Middle School, these, eighth, these kids are now transitioned to a high school and they'll be receiving a different device. So we need to get those devices back from last year's eighth graders so we can give them for the incoming sixth graders. Um, and that's just a list of all your outgoing grades in, in schools that we will be asking to be collected in the week of August 3rd. Plus, uh, if any, if again, also if anything is damaged, please give it to us so we can give us a couple weeks to fix them before school starts. Uh, one of the things we did was we're starting the process of upgrading our card catalog system. Not only does it do our physical books in school, but it's also how we track our inventory for the Chromebooks and how we know who's assigned to what device. Uh, this newer version also allows us more possibility for eBooks to check eBooks out through the same system um, as it's a more advanced system. So that might be necessary for distant learning. So we have more opportunity for that. Um, purchase the replacement Chromebooks uh, for the third and fourth grade. Um, it was part of our five-year technology plan. And are you ready for me? This one is near and dear to my heart. So we are recommending um, that we purchase Chromebooks for our second grade um, students. And they would be the same Chromebooks that our third and fourth graders are using. And um, I have some reasons for that, but I'd love to share with you. So one, 
particularly if we go back into distance learning or even if we have a modified schedule, um, certainly would be very helpful to have some devices and at least our second graders' hands. It will also help our third grade teachers um, and our third grade schools um, as students will be acclimated to the Chromebooks. They'll know their emails, they'll know their passwords, they'll know how to navigate the Chromebook and some of that learning will already have taken place so that instruction um, can occur quicker um, with assessments and, and um, Google Chrome and um, I'm sorry, Google Classroom and things like that. Um, also, our social studies curriculum and our science curriculum has a very robust uh, e-learning component. Um, and the social studies curriculum, there are some leveled books at the primary level that teachers could use um, in their classroom for students that is informational reading, you know, to build uh, that capacity that they don't necessarily get the most use out of currently. And that's the same with our science as well. Um, and Do virtual our learning. wonders plat Through virtual learning. I'm sorry. You, had, you said these books are for I'm sorry, virtual, I'm hearing. Virtual, virtual learning? Yes. Okay. Thank you. They can use it in the classroom as well okay, um, with this component as well when they're doing their small group instruction and things like that. The Wonders program also has a very robust um, e-component where students can get on and do some very wonderful things with that. Um, the card catalog management system that um, we're getting, the Fallette, the Destiny, also has some robust e-books that students um, can check out and read on their devices as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, and last would be as an, another item that we had on the technology plan was upgrading our district firewall. Um, <laughs> one was because of our audit, they wanted to see a redundant system. Right now we have a single box uh, and they don't like to see single points of failure. So the idea is to go to a, not only an upgraded system, but it's a redundant system in case one fails, another one will kick on automatically. Um, it also gives us better idea of when you to look at into the traffic and better filter and better block any kind of outside threats um, coming in. Uh, our budgeting position again, we, we just talked about it, was the second grade Chromebooks. Um, this would be basically a one-to-one -one for the second grade. Um, it's about, I think about 512 students at 214,102. Any questions? Um, we just bought Chromebooks for third and fourth grade students. And one of the things was we, we bought them because to get them in time, we had to order them a month ago or a couple weeks ago. So I'm wondering how quickly we'd even get these if this went through. The ones that are in third and fourth grade now, could they be utilized for second grade? Or do we have enough of them to be operational? Just to get us through this year and this then wouldn't be a... Just the, the, one of the, well, one, they're all out of warranty, just to let you know that. They're, they're all out of but warranty. But it's a new program, I mean, just, we'd have a lot more than we would need just for one grade. That's what I'm just thinking. Right, but I'm going to say the current third and fourth that we're trying to replace, mm -hmm. they're completely out of warranty. Oh, so so if you go to one-to-one, -one, you've got to have some kind of spares on the side in order to make that happen. Uh, another part is Chromebooks only get supported for about five years or so before you're not allowed to update them anymore. Um, and so we only have like one remaining year on those. Um, my kind of thought was the idea is if we can get them in time, or we're getting replaced sometime in the fall is to take those third and fourth and at least get half of them if they're, if they're working in, in good enough condition. I mean, when it's that four years, batteries start to fail, become a problem. You don't get the eight hours, 10 hours like you're used to. It's to get them to the first grade at least. Yeah. So it can be maybe one to 12, one to one, and get at least another grade level, you know, by the second grade, and use the whole third and fourth at least to get first grade done, and anything remainder would be for parts and our ones that are no longer any good. So you don't feel they'd be good for the second graders? I know it'd be nice to have new ones, don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. But we also got to look at uh, financial understand. issues, and that's one of them. I mean, they can be. It's just I, I was also trying to get another okay. grade level as well. Just to understand. Speak. So we, what have we been funded for this year, capital? We, the third and fourth grade replacements, we've been funded for that, right? Yes, we bought them. Okay, and the other one is... Um, the firewall issue, didn't we get funded for that yes. already? Is that going to handle um, the security for PK to 2? Yes, it's, it's, it's um, the new one we're getting is basically double everything, double the RAM, double the processing, double the ability, so but it's a much more. But we're giving the PK to 2 kids Google names and 
Yes. Password, so that is totally protected, will be totally protected. Yeah, it's, it's no different than we do one for the third and 12th. They're in the same system. They're set up the same way um, and kind of that walled garden that we kind of have set up. So they're going to be set up the same way we do the rest of the grade levels. Okay. We were thinking um, with our pre-K, K, and first grade students, the email that they have, the, the children, of course, it's not appropriate for them to have the email and access. It's for the parents as they log in to different things. Yeah, we can Second things grade, off. when maybe deemed appropriate, theirs would be turned on. Um, to begin to learn the emailing process once digital citizenship is, has an opportunity to be taught and reviewed and, and things like that to help prepare them as they transition to third graders. Right, okay. One of the questions is accessing the broadband. What were you saying about that? Is that gonna be in place? The county is paying for this up county and that's happening by the time we start school? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a quote for how much that's gonna cost in wiring by next week. Great. That's awesome. I, I've already told the company, I've already been in, in talks with the company that I want it done by before August 27th. They feel very confident that they can get, have it done by August 27th. And that might They're very quick. Our big, our big gaps that we have up county. Um, you know, is that what the thought is? Well, I this would be for our school, so at least we have a, we know there will be, at our school locations, there will be at least a access point in our parking lots at every one of our buildings. This isn't really designed for like communities. That's more, I think county has another big picture that they're looking to about. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, that, that's separate. That's a whole, that's a separate thing. Okay. So yeah, that, yeah. So that's not a, yeah. I thought, wow, that's great. So we'll find Yeah, this is just an addition. So we're going to, as far as the hot spots and all that goes, are, are, are we, do we have any idea of who's not going to be able to still not connect with us? Uh, I, not, I don't, I mean, the schools, I handled all the schools and they were reported back to schools that they didn't have it. Um, it. Mainly it is North area, which is where we're asking the county to focus is the, more on the North area. If they're ever gonna install wireless in communities or stuff like that, we would like to see it more in the, in the North County. Um, but no, I, I don't have, anybody that asked for a hotspot, we gave them one. That, that was our feeling. Anybody that asked for one, we gave them one. It might not necessarily work, but we, we at least gave them one to try out. Um, just w worry that we're still going to have those kids missing. Well, we, we are because they are, and the schools know who those kids are because if they are not in proximity to a cell um, tower, then they still can't get it. The hotspot is not of use to them. So those families would have to get to a school or a public building that does have Wi-Fi. Um, the thinking is if they can get to, you know, one of those buildings, if they're on full virtual, then they can download whatever they need at that school or upload when they come back so that the teachers can get it because we really, really want to get away from the paper packets. Um, over the summer, Mr. Walls and probably Mr. Um, Watkins as well will be uh, pulling in families um, in small groups to get them accustomed to using the technology because we had about 89% of the families at Sutlersville Elementary School on paper packets. Um, and part of that had to do with their um, unfamiliarity and the language barrier for some in using the technology. So he's trying to mitigate that over the summer. Well, we and also we should make every effort if if these kids up there can't get to the school, then we need to transport them to the school. Maybe we need to work with a bus system and see how we get them, like have a set, set time, we meet them at a neighborhood, we bring them to the school. They, I mean, we gotta look at so, that. So, so they aren't completely out for, for the whole year. Right, so remember, we're gonna have at the elementary school level, we certainly are gonna have some level of face-to-face. -face. So kids are gonna be coming in the building, all of them at some point. So they'll still be able to upload, download, and that kind of thing when they are in the school building. So they will have that. Um, but point well taken. Middle but, school, uh, high school, what about that? And, and there we're gonna have the same thing. I mean, I don't know uh, what the expense would be, and part of it is because of the transportation. Um, we're looking at a situation where we're in pretty dire straits, as you well know, uh, with transportation costs. So we'll, we'll look and see what we can do, certainly. Yeah, I think that's just another solution. We may need to physically pick up these kids and bring them to a school, um, high school and middle school in particular, because they're all virtual. So thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yep, you know the drill. <laughs> and the next team, our um, final Tiger Team Six.
will be headed in and that's going to be um, staffing professional development and teacher evaluations. You already spoke with Mrs. Schreckenga. She's going to be one of the project managers for that. And I believe Ms. Kovac is on um, leave nice summer, at this Thanks. point. Thank you both. Long time to see. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. And before I begin, I just want to thank Tiger Team 6. Uh, we have a really committed group of teachers and supervisors and specialists and administrators um, representing all levels, elementary, middle, and high, who are truly committed to making sure that we provide teachers and staff with the supports that they need to be most successful. So I will share just briefly a few of our recommendations. One area of focus for our team is recruiting, interviewing, and hiring new staff. And truly, there aren't significant recommendations in this area. Um, we recommend that we follow our current protocols and continue with um, online interviews as needed. Um, two other things that we've recommended, if we are in a hybrid or a distance learning situation, is developing an, a virtual new teacher orientation program and considering also how our mentor program is set up to provide um, perhaps school-based mentors for our new teachers. And of course, with all of these recommendations, we'll just need to continue evaluating policy to make sure that we are aligned um, with any changing expectations. The next area of focus is teacher professional development. And our first recommendation was to administer the teacher survey that I shared with you earlier this evening. Um, we will then ideally begin tailoring professional development based upon teacher need. We know that there are going to be topics that everyone needs to have, you know, things like health and safety protocols, information about our local um, LMS, our HR policies, social emotional learning, but then there are going to be things that are unique to individual teachers. And we would love to be able to create online modules so that teachers can differentiate their learning needs. We could utilize those 37 teachers out there who feel really comfortable and um, are willing to share their expertise. We could also use the resources from MSDE and potentially from external virtual providers. And um, we know that Innovation Center Team 4 has been working on a professional development handbook, so we could work with them to make sure that that is also aligned with a virtual setting. The next recommendation involves professional development for administrators and supervisors. And you know something really critical for us to all remember is that we need to be able to support our teachers, we need to be able to support our families and build our capacity to support them. So a lot of the professional development that we've recommended or that teachers have said they need, that would benefit our group as well. Um, if necessary, we will continue utilizing the online platform for our virtual ANS meetings. Staff utilization. Um, this really, we believed as a team, focuses more on our non-teaching staff and we recognize that principals and direct supervisors are continue to be responsible for task delegation. But perhaps we as principals and supervisors could develop a bank of suggested or potential tasks to best utilize all staff and get creative in the ways that people um, are being used so that everything gets done. The last two recommendations involve observations and feedback and coaching in a virtual setting. So we know that teaching in a virtual environment looks an awful lot different than teaching in a classroom. So we would need, we believe, to work closely to establish clear expectations for what online teaching and observation should, should look like and then adapt our current observation tool that, so that it aligns with those expectations for planning and instruction, assessment, and climate in a virtual environment. And we would need, when, when we make these recommendations, to work closely with the association to be sure that it is um, acceptable to all parties. The last recommendation involves teacher feedback and coaching. Currently, we have program walkthrough tools and um, checklists that we use. So we thought it would be helpful to develop an informal walkthrough checklist and also provide specific professional development to our instructional specialists to help them support teachers in distance learning. The implications for the budget focus 
entirely on um, stipends for the creation of these tools and for professional development. And it's about $10,000. Any questions? Any questions? Dr. Kane, are these the kind of chart of stipends we're going to be using um, what we talked about earlier in the summertime? For, for the CARES dollars, mm -hmm. LMS, absolutely, right. COVID, mm -hmm. right. yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There are some other um, professional development that we've talked about throughout um, that individualize and the modules and sometimes they can be virtual, sometimes they can be pre-recorded, sometimes we have access to online ones that we get from a vendor. Um, so there are a variety of different ways that we can provide professional development. Yep. Ms. Schreckengoss, thank you very thank much. Thank you. We appreciate thank your take leadership. Care. And then Mr. P will follow up with a summary of the um, budget implications. So uh, <clears throat> we just wanted to provide, as, as you've gone through this presentation and each one of the Tiger teams, we just wanted to summarize in one shot for you um, each one of those teams with an overall, uh, the total estimated district loss of revenue, just under 700,000, and then an estimated district budget implication of uh, just over 800,000. Uh, with that, uh, we just wanted to leave you with some additional next steps and we can talk about general questions overall. Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, beginning tonight, uh, just after this presentation, all the way to July 24th, um, this presentation and uh, all the recommendations will be posted on our website, uh, right on our homepage, and we will seek public comment um, to the entire plan. Uh, at that point, we've been directed by the superintendent. We'll use that information uh, as we gather more uh, as in time data and then to come back to you on August the 5th uh, for an updated presentation on some final recommendations and then by August 14th by mandated by the state that we have to have our plan uh, posted uh, on our website by August 14th and with that I'll turn it over to Dr. Kane or just open up the any, general any questions. Any other questions? And is it possible to I think that's update? too late. Yeah, is yes, it update really that? too late. At that timeline up a little bit? I mean, is it possible if the state gives us just direction or? You, you don't, you're not talking about the August the 14th. Oh, yes. You're talking. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they've, they've, they've taken care of that. That's settled with them. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't change ours. Okay. 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 That's what I'm saying. If we let, let parents know by August 5th, that'd be lovely because I think they need time to get. And, and yeah, I would say that, yeah, would, that, yeah, that would be let, our goal. That, right. that, that's correct. And we chose August the 5th because that's the next board meeting. And so we wanted to make sure that this information got to you. We had ample opportunity to get feedback from the community um, and our employees, make those changes, create the final recommendation to come to this board by August the 5th. And, you know, if there are no other concerns, some of this, let me just preface is all by saying some of this is not going to be final right as restrictions are lifted as we get new information so what I've been calling it is our final iteration right because it's going to continue it is an iterative process and it will continue to change as information comes to us but parents need to have some idea of what school is going to be like in the beginning of the year so august the 14th is is established by msde but we certainly can have our final plan after it's come to the board august the 5th okay yeah, yeah i definitely be think that because i mean daycare that issue, that daycare, even what's going to happen with parents, some going back to work, right. some home, same as our employees. This needs to be ironed out if we're doing AA, BB, AB, whatever we decide to do. I think it's going to be a, a issue because you're both working with the working parents and students, and it doesn't look like it's going to be five days a week with students in classrooms. It is correct. And Unless you, something happens between now and then. I, yes. Oh. But, um, you know, then we have the, the middle school and high school different things and, you know, different parents have or different families have different situations that they, you know, kids watching kids. And I think the fifth is the absolute latest. We are be fair to our teachers, our students and our parents and our community that we need to have a decision. Made. And if we meet the end of August, end of July for an update and then so we can have some final decisions August. 
Well, I mean, it's up to the board. We certainly can. We don't want to cut short the time for feedback too much. We recognize that families are, you know, some are away, some are doing what, and we want to give ample time. Like give them but we can push ours back a bit if you want to have a board meeting prior to August the f I mean, I don't know how you want to do it, but that was the reason that we chose August the 5th. Correct. I'm willing to have it, a, a board meeting sometime in July to get, a, you know, so we get some kind of consensus between the board and the staff and, you, you know, your direction. And so on the 5th, we can actually send something out pretty much hard line. Again, this well, is that all fluid. Would still, yeah, that would still be the case August the 5th, okay. you know, it, the evening of August the 5th. But well, fine, unless but there were some major changes. I think we ought to have it earlier. Frankly, I, uh, because we say August 5th, then we're sending it out August. The parents have, what do they got? Three weeks then to figure out what to do with their Well, they have lives. some idea now of seeing this. Know. Yeah, but they don't know ABBA, they gotta get. I think so it's come, still two days. If you do A day, B day, or A, A, B, B, it's still two days. What about? Oh, they're setting up babysitters and stuff. I, I just think it should be earlier. Frankly. But we could set that and the state could come out a week later and say, no one's going back into the buildings. Correct. And now they've got to find daycare for a full week. No, agreed, so but... That's another I mean, change they've got to do on the fly. If, if daycares open. If, and that, if daycares daycare. are even open. Okay. So we have to be very fluid and very, I mean, we have to... I, I agree, but I just think we ought to make a decision why earlier than to, August 5th. Why do we have to treat uh, the elementary school the same way as we treat middle and senior? Usually elementary school kids are daycared uh, for part of this and for, or they use the school as the daycare and both parents are working. Maybe we bifurcate the plan to start the, the uh, elementary school people first and then start the others which are more flexible. Uh, the people who have younger children use the elementary school as their daycare. Uh, uh, if you don't believe me, uh, wait till the phone calls come. I, I'm just making it a point of consideration, that's all. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think we ought to maybe make a decision even by, you know, the, the July 15th, whenever we have a, a mid-month meeting and make a decision on the elementary is fine. That's the one that they care about. That's the one that's gonna d involve Should babysitters. They really care. Well, I mean, you, they all you, care about it. I don't get that wrong. Right, but they right. care about babysitting. That's what I meant. They care about the babysitting more so on the elementary. If you make a decision on that um, earlier rather than later is my recommendation. Well, it looks like we're gonna have two days of school a week, three days you're not gonna be. I mean, that looks like the most thing. And it kind of goes back to the, I guess, graduation. You know, look at the issues we had there. You can only make the decision, you want as much time as you can to make the decision. I think if we can make it by the 15th, it's too late, but I don't know if we're doing this justice if we try to make it too earlier than that and not know what we're doing. Which the we might 15th not know. of July? No, no, I just think the 1st of August, which is the 15th, or 10th, 5th, I'm sorry, it has a lot of moving parts in this. And I think daycare is one of the biggest ones and what families are gonna be able to do. That's gonna throw a whole whole thing in there. Um, I guess Sid's gonna get a George Jetson plane to take care of all these bus right. issues because the buses aren't an example, but George Jetson, remember that? Uh -huh. he, can, he can help you out. Uh, so I just, I, th I think we can keep updated as much as we can on our website. You know, we'll have discussion this at our next meeting and hopefully it could be a little more formalized, but you know, I I think we're between a rock and a hard crayon making a decision premature, but the fifth is I think we gotta make it by. I think in fairness to our you know And that that's the plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can agree with that. We have to have enough inf get enough input from the community to make sound decisions for our system. I think it's premature to try and push it before August fifth. Plans have to be made. People have to be to talk to, and I and again, it could, as you said, Mrs. Moore said, it could change, and in, a, in an incident. Look what happened in March. We all thought we were coming back March 27th, and then Not April. Not all of us thought that. Well, that be as it may, we have to be fluid and we have to be adapt. 
and we're able also, to adapt to our, our what's going on. And we're also right on target with which is recommended by the Maryland State Department of Education. When's the final time we have to well, put out our information? We typically ask the superintendents, what can you do? And from what I saw, <laughs> we are way ahead yeah. of where anybody would have expected us to be because we were very good at jumping in and dealing with the COVID shutdown and we learned. We did learn and the state superintendent did speak with uh, superintendents and it was to be earlier and, and knowing all that has to be done and all of the moving parts and ensuring that we have the staff and, and folks to do the work during the summer, she pushed it back for us because it was just unreasonable for, I mean, we just, if you think about it, we just finished with continuity of learning right. <laughs> for closing out the school year. Right. It's just yeah. July 1st, you know? That's so we needed some time. She pushed it back for everybody. Correct. We are ready to go ahead and we shouldn't be held back no. if we can do it. Right, so our issue is we don't want to, so we could have come to you tonight and say, these are our recommendations. We've surveyed our parents, we've surveyed our teachers twice, um, but they haven't had an opportunity. They've given some input, but they haven't had an opportunity to respond to the recommendations. And we need to know if it is something that is absolutely not gonna work for a majority of our families before school starts. And so we wanted to give them an opportunity to give, react to the recommendations before we said, okay, this is what we're gonna go with. This is July the 1st, it's now being TV'd and it'll probably be, what, it's, it'll be uh, available on the internet, YouTube, but um, it, it is Friday, up tonight. 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 Yep, and um, the plan is on the website tonight, so the families be. can start to respond to it, go through it. They'll see all of the moving pieces, and and they can they can respond to it. We obviously surveyed the, the, the yeah. parents, mm -hmm. and somebody ought to send an email blast to all of them. Hey, look at the presentations that took place we will. at the school board meeting on July the 1st. Mr. P is already on it. I'm sure He's he is. waiting to get it going. Mr. Trade's got it all lined up okay. as soon as this is over. If I can just add, maybe end with this, uh, is just a thank you. Um, you saw this evening, there's a lot of work. <laughs> that happened in three weeks. That's right by the leaders that were here before you, that they were leading multiple groups of multiple individuals. You know, many of these project managers are principals and they were trying to close out a year, end up observations and leading these teams as well. I, I just want to reach out, I know on behalf, you know, Dr. Kane feels the same way. It's just, thank you. You know, you can see what can happen when people work together as a team. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to thank them all and, personally. And for all the emails that families have sent to us to say thank you for considering this and thank you and make sure that you think about this. We are just grateful for our staff, our our community, and thank you for your attentive tonight, your t attentiveness tonight and asking the questions that probably some parents out there are asking, Correct. right? So we'll, we'll address those things. Thank you so much. And, you. and again, we do appreciate what all the administrators, the teachers, everyone who's been a part of this process, this whole COVID-19 um, pandemic that we've all had to experience. I mean, I, I, from the board, we thank them all for what they've done for our students. And with that, could we please, uh, it's quarter, almost quarter nine, we'll take a break, we're back at nine o'clock. Thank you. And we are back, Board of Education, Queen Anne's County, open meeting. We are at uh, 7.01, Human Resources Report. Do I have a motion to accept the Human Resource Report as presented in closed session? So moved. I, I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the Human Resources Report as presented in closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion is carried. 7.02, uh, contracts for approval. The first one is the Educational Facilities Master Plan. Ms. Pullen, long time no see. Good evening once again. 
I am here this evening to ask your approval for the uh, 2020 Educational Facilities Master Plan. If you recall, during your meeting two weeks ago, there was a presentation and you have a draft copy. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, listen to any concerns that you have about this year's document. Everyone have a chance to look to mm -hmm. look at it? Well, I, I didn't have a full chance because I just got it Monday and had, but I've looked at some of it. One question I had on page 24, Kent County's out of it now. Those were the updates that yes. So that is uh, developed by some of our partners here in the building. So that wasn't directly a section of mine that I'm affiliated with. I can follow up on that, but yes, for the revisions that were made, mm -hmm. they removed Kent County from that. So they're no longer in the consortium. That's the information that was given to me, but I will follow up on that. To we're, we're not, we don't have to pass this tonight. Yes. yes. It has to go to the state. Yes. So just for, uh, just for information, this is a letter that's being sent to Mr. Michael Bayer, the manager of infrastructure development um, at MSD, I yes. take it. So is it Department of Planning. this is the letter that is enclosed uh, with the 2020 Educational Facilities Master Plan for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. This document incorporates the latest information regarding our schools, including applicable da data, updates, revi revises our current and projected programs, and addresses our facility needs. This plan has been coordinated with the QAC Department of Planning and Zoning based upon the 2010 Comprehensive Plan. The enrollment projections portrayed in this document have been approved uh, by the Maryland Department of Planning. And as of this meeting, the Educational Facilities Master Plan for 2020 was approved as a working document. That has to go over to MSDE tomorrow. Is that correct? Yes, that's why it is, we have to have the vote on it tonight. So any other questions, comments, revisions on the master plan? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the Educational Facilities Master Plan for 2020. So moved. I have, a, I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comment on the motion to uh, vote on the educational master's plan? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Abstain. Ayes have it. The motion is carried. Abstain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me. There's an abstain. Did you get that? I apologize. It's four, four, and one abstention. Thank you, Ms. Pullen. Okay. Do I have a motion uh, to approve for the Ken Allen High School uh, to furnish and install a Bradley lavatory sink and a student's bathroom? Contract Bayer Mechanical LLC. Fiscal dollar amount $78,000. Budgeted from the 2021 capital budget. Do I have a motion? I move. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Pinder. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, President Harper, Dr. Kane, board members, Sid Pender, uh, Chief Operating Officer. Um, if you walk into Ken Allen High School, those uh, bathrooms, the countertops and sinks were installed in 1998. They have about a 10 to 12 year lifespan. Um, it's laminated wood on there. We're seeking to replace them with um, the Bradley lavatory sinks, which are made of much better material, have a longer lifespan, um, are chemical resistant, scratch resistant, um, and we're looking to get a longer lifespan out of those uh, and replace them into three men's bathrooms and the three women's bathrooms. Um, we have the three quotes listed there, um, and Bauer uh, Mechanical um, was the lowest. And this is in our I'm sorry, yes, budget. This was in yes. This is one one of the projects that um, came out of our uh, FY 21 capital budget, and it was identified in our facility assessment as needing repaired and replaced. Any other questions or comments? Have we dealt with this contractor before? Yes, he's suitable. Yeah, we've had quality work done by them before. So just for clarification, there was three bids that were put in for this. Right, I saw so that. we're in compliance. Yep. Yeah, but I just, I just, I, he's low bid on all three of them, and I just know that we know him. Yeah, we've had, he's done several jobs for us. So hearing no other discussion, I call for the vote on the motion for the Ken Allen High School uh, 
furnish and install the Bradley Laboratory sinks with contract with Bauer Mechanical, fiscal dollar amount of $78,000 from the FY 2021 capital budget. All, uh, all motions say aye. 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 Proof. aye. Opposed say no, the ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. I'm we sorry, Timmy, we said 78,000, but the lowest bid was 71,3. That's just in case, yeah. I'm sorry. What yeah, they need to be, I'm sorry, they need to be, that's, I have the wrong amount there. Uh, it should be. Um, well, you can't spend any more than $78,000. It's backwards, that? but yes, it's, okay. it's correct. Okay. I apologize, that's but, my mistake. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. So um, you'll just make adjustments on that, Mr. Fister? Yes. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept uh, for the Bayside Elementary School furnish and install the Bradley, Bradley Laboratory sinks with Bauer Mechanical? The fiscal dollar amount of $51,600 from the FY 2021 capital budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Pinder. Yes, ma'am. Same thing. Um, laminated uh, countertops, sinks. They were installed 29 years ago. Um, looking to replace them. Um, the money will come from capital FY uh, 21. Again, this was identified in a facilities assessment. Any other qu questions? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the Bayside Elementary School to furnish uh, and install Bradley Laboratory sinks with Bauer Mechanical, fiscal dollar amount $51,600 from the FY 2021 capital budget. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Apologize for the dead airspace. Do I have a motion to accept for Kennard Elementary School to furnish and install Bradley Laboratory sinks, Bauer Mechanical, fiscal dollar amount of $35,300 from the FY 2020 capital budget? Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Pender. Yes, ma'am. Same situation as the previous two schools um, installed in 2001. They're now 19 years old and um, needing replacement. We had um, funding from the FY20 capital budget so allocated for this. Okay. And again, the same three folks yes, um, bid on this project. Any questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion for the Kennard, Kennard Elementary School to furnish and install Bradley, Bradley Lavatory sinks with Bauer Mechanical Fiscal Impact $35,300 from the FY 2020 capital budget. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Do I have a motion to accept Bus Patrol America LLC School Bus Stop Arm Enforcement Program? So moved. Fiscal dollar amount. Uh, there's no fiscal dollar amount to this. I have a motion. I move. I have a second. Second. Question, comments, discussion, Mr. Pender. Yes, ma'am. This is uh, this has been a long time coming. Um, I just want to say, from the county commissioners approving the ordinance to having the state's attorney, the sheriff's department involved in this, um, it, it's it's been about a two two and a half year process of getting everything into place. Um, we have gone through several vendors that we um, have worked with to see which vendor fits our needs the best. Um, one major concern, I think I, I voiced this before, was we wanted every school bus to have a camera, red light runner camera on it, not just a select few. Um, with this contract um, approval, that enables us for that to happen. Um, and um, so every school bus will have a camera. Um, We've worked with the contractors who have, have you know, worked well with us, the four LLCs, um, to make this happen. And Darren, Mr. Burns, has um, reviewed this and, you know, and approved it on his end. Um, Lieutenant Meal and Sergeant Davidson from the Sheriff's Office were, were of great help getting this put together also. Um, um, tonight I'm seeking approval for the contract for uh, five years. Um, at the end of five years, you can also uh, renew for another five years. So, um, any other questions, any comments, other? or concerns? Well, the public should know that uh, 
stop school buses are too often bypassed mm -hmm. uh, when their lights are flashing, the bar is out, and it's just a matter of time before a child is run over. You're and absolutely right. This, this is one way that I think we can stop that from happening. You're absolutely and alerting right. the public that they're going to be on TV if you pass a stop school and bus. There will be a social uh, blitz and information pushing that out to them as part of the package. So that was my quick next question was. And there will be a grace period until it's fully, you know, okay. enacted. So um, this has been a long time coming. This is probably one of the great idea. Yeah. I can't believe there's going to be a grace period. They've had a grace period. <laughs> So, right. Any other questions, comments, discussion? I call for the vote on the motion to accept the contract with Bus Patrol America LLC School Bus Stop Arm Enforcement Program. Fiscal impact dollar amount none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All aye. opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pender. Yes, ma'am. Apologize for just a second. Okay, I just Do I have a motion for the contract approval with College Board? Contract period July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Fiscal impact dollar amount of $30,000, 390, $30,395. Dollars, FY 2021 operating budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Pluski. Uh, Madam President. Madam President, the superintendent recommends, uh, this is our annual contract uh, with the college board, which includes the PSAT for 10th graders and it will include um, the SAT for 11th graders in March. Uh, 24, 2021, with a makeup date of April the 13th, 2021. Again, annual contract out of the FY21 operating <coughs> budget. Does this also include the 12th graders? I, I, that, that's a great question, um, Captain Kelly. If you remember from this year's contract, we weren't able to deliver that. We were just able to move that over. So yes, we will be administering. That's not in this contract. Oh, okay. That was in last year's contract, okay. but we've just, we've paid for it. Okay. We're now just gonna administer it September 23rd, to be exact. Okay. Good question. The other question I have is um, the, um, when you say here, it improves their SAT scores says it's a wealth of college prep and planning. Is there something in addition to the test that they offer the kids? I, I never heard of that. There's a variety of, of resources that the college board provides students um, um, as part of their suite of tools. The other thing, if you remember, that I mentioned earlier today is that we're, um, through our online programming, we're able to offer the SAT prep over the summer free. So that's that. That's an additional resources uh, resource for us as well. Is that uh, the college boards providing that for you guys? Uh, the course. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah, it's it's it, it's a college board course that we're able to offer through a vendor, a vendor, so that students will be able to support their preparation, especially for those students who are going to take it in September. Right. So there is no other. I'm I'm just confused on the write up here. It, it, that is just for the paying for the tests, right? Correct. This, this contract. Correct. Okay. Correct. Right. Thank you. But with that contract in, includes a whole host of resources provided by. And the kids have access to that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, I call for the contract approval, the motion to approve the contract approval for college board contract period July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, fiscal dollar amount $30,395, FY 2021 operating budget. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. <clears throat> Do I have a motion to accept the contract for the high school English digital licenses and consumable textbooks, fiscal dollar imp Impact dollar amount of fifty-eight thousand eight hundred twenty-three eighty-one cents. Operating budget 
the budget source is operating budget FY 2021. Do I have a motion? I moved. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Paluski. Madam, Madam President, Superintendent recommends Savas Learning My Perspective, English 9 through 12, and with me is my esteemed colleague, uh, Mrs. Bridget Passan, uh, who is all things English literacy, 9, 12, 3 to 12, uh, you name it, in literacy, and uh, she's our expert. So I'm gonna let her explain um, our high school program. Good evening, President Harper, members of the board, Dr. Kane, members of the executive team. It's actually so nice to be here. And happy July. I know you've had quite an evening, a lot of information for you tonight. This is just my annual request to um, support our high school English courses with digital licenses that include the textbook online, as well as lots of other supplemental resources for students to use in their English courses um, and the consumables, um, which were requesting at a very conservative level. Um, we surveyed all teachers uh, at both high schools to see how many consumables they would like to need that meet their teaching style and the class roster that they hope to be grading uh, in the fall. Um, so this is just part of our core uh, English high school uh, programs um, that we need that we need to run them. Okay. Any questions, comments, discussion? <coughs> So I call for the vote on the motion to accept the contract to the high school English digital licenses and consumable textbooks with Savas Learning. And it's fiscal impact dollar amount of 58,823.81 cents. Uh, budget source operating FY 2021 budget. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept the SPARC K2, 3 through 5, 6 through 8 in high school and SPARC inclusive PE uh, textbooks? So moved. Sorry, fiscal impact dollar amount of $8,279.25. Budget source FY 2020 capital dollars. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. second. Questions, comments, discussion? Mr. Pluski. Madam uh, President, Superintendent recommends uh, the Spark Inclusive Physical Education K-12. Uh, at our last uh, meeting well over a month ago, I presented that to you. Uh, to date, we have not received any public comment uh, on our webpage uh, or to Mr. Michael Page um, uh, about those materials. So we just would request uh, your approval. Any questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the contract for SPARC K through 12, 3rd th through 5th, 6th through 8th, and high school and SPARC inclu inclusive PE books. Fiscal dollar amount $8,279.25 from the FY 2020 capital budget. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Do I have a motion to accept the contract for the middle school ELA 8th eight, novel, Coraline? Fiscal impact dollar amount of $3,201.60. Budget source, Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant Year 3. Do I have a motion? A move. We're not going to approve that today, are we? Or is this a first read? Have we read this? For, uh, actually, for a 30 day or for uh, okay. public comment, yeah, correct, Captain ready. Kelly? Need a second. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, I have a second. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Questions, comments, discussion. Now, on here, just for clarification, I am understanding that this is an action item that we are actually purchasing this book. We, we will. Not we, we, with the exception of um, through Comor, that we have to provide that. Uh, any of our instructional materials have to go out for a public comment review. Okay, because that's not what's on here. This, to me, this uh, this reads as a con this reads as a contract, not as going out for a first read. Well, any of our, I believe, any of our materials of instruction which have the textbook. review, the oh, textbook the evaluation form, which also includes uh, the budget implication, which would also be a contract with an individual vendor. So the okay. board knows of the public. So we're. Okay, so this is supposed to be going out for first read? 
uh, actually it's not, n not a first read, it's just a, a general uh, out for public review okay. for 30 days until, and then we would come back in August, just like you did uh, with the SPARC curriculum, presented that the first time after review to the public. Um, okay. Mrs. Pass is here to answer any questions as well as we'll put that out uh, on our webpage for any public comment. So I'll withdraw the motion and ask for it to go out for public read. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So withdrawing the motion for accepting this novel. Do I have a motion to send out for, for, for public information the uh, middle school ELA eighth grade novel Coraline? Do I have a motion? So moved. A second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Okay. You want to tell us about this book? Sure. So I am exceedingly tardy on getting this in front of you. Um, I was supposed to bring it in fall of 2018 um, per request to fill by the teachers to fill our Thrill of Horror unit. Um, in eighth grade, uh, we had a Striving Readers Grant and new reading interventions. Lots of things came before it. So I am sorry for my delay. Um, we, uh, in the spring and before we had to leave due to COVID-19, we were working to um, finalize some units in the eighth grade curriculum um, because there they're, they're actually short too and we're getting ready for that audit in a couple years so this book will support that that thrill of horror unit um it's almost a novella it's it's over there it is very short um it is uh, about uh, a girl um and i don't know if any of you have raised middle school girls or no middle school girls but she really doesn't like her parents and so she goes through this door um and she's in this parallel universe where there are other parents um, and ultimately, and it has a lot of creepy scenes, um, but it is very engaging and, and certainly needed in this time to totally distract our kids, especially our eighth graders. So it's just a way to meet that need of not totally um, terrifying them, but teach them how an author develops um, suspense. Oh, Ms. And, and in the end, she comes to, a, to adore, um, appreciate her real parents, which you've had girls. You have girls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we watched the movie Car Coraline okay, a lot great. when it came Caroline. out. It's creepy. <laughs> right. Yes, so we hope my to girls and I love those. it. Good, good. <laughs> I don't get to read it. I can't it persist. Girls. Caroline. <laughs> it's it's yes, actually Coraline. The name of the little girl is named Coraline. Oh, I, I figured that's what it was, but yeah, it's Coraline. But what's the Yes. Here. So, um, any other questions, comments, the discussion? Name Car it's Coraline. Caroline, and they call her Caroline. Okay, I call for. The no, she went crazy. No. Oh. I call for the vote of the motion to uh, send out for public review the middle school ELA eighth grade novel Coraline. Do I have uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to send out for informational review uh, the employee travel policy uh, po policy 315 and the regulation title 315.1 3, I have a motion so moved. I have second. a second questions comments discussion hi Mr. Fister hello I'm sort of missing sitting up here in front of you like we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. So I'm glad I had something to talk <laughs> something and present to, to you about. Yeah, something to do. Um, <laughs> before you tonight, asleep. I'm sorry, sir. You weren't asleep back there. You oh, no, not at all. You were before to work. Um, before you tonight is our first draft of, for first read that we're asking for you to send it out for um, first reading is a, a true employee travel policy. We have this policy 306, which is uh, basically a statement, but I, I wanted to take it and actually make it an employee travel policy and associated regulation that's why we've renumbered it to 315 and and then we'll come back once we get this approved um, and get rid of 306 because it's it's not a policy it's a one it's a one statement that you currently have out there on the website um, it's a new policy it follows general employee travel guidelines um, that we've been following with the IRS, but this kind of solidifies everything. Purpose of this policy, establish guidelines for business-related employee travel and reimbursement of qualified expenses to employees who travel on behalf of or represent Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Um, it's fairly you know, self-explanatory, uh, defining local travel, you know, what's a conference, business travel. The big things that I wanted to mention to you in the regulation, which is where we get into the nuts and bolts of, uh, of administering this, is we're really defining commuting mileage because even with this COVID situation that we've experiencing, uh, what's commuting mileage? You, if working from home, is that considered commuting mileage when you have to come in the, into the school? And most certainly it does. Um, so this will clean up uh, and clear up a lot of that discussion about
about what's con uh, commuting mileage. The other thing on page two of the regulation is we're proposing to go to a flat reimbursement rate for uh, meals. What we currently do, it's an exhaustive evaluative process um, that to me doesn't prove any value. Uh, we look at what time the, I'll use a, a flight for example. We look at what time the flight is leaving and decide whether, well that person would be, re you know, receive reimbursement for a breakfast, a lunch or a dinner. And then when they arrive and then what meals are available at a conference, whether it's a buffet kind of dinner or whether, you know, they would be going out with a group. And so this just eliminates it that you get $35 on the day of travel. Um, you know, first or last, but not both, and then $50 per day uh, for your full day of attendance, and that's actually below uh, some of the IRS rules, depending on, of course, where you travel. Um, Centerville, honestly, is a very expensive place if you look at the, the guidelines on the, on the IRS. Um, travel, you type in our zip code on the IRS guidelines, it'll tell you what's appropriate for a hotel cost to get reimbursed um, and meals. And if you fly out to someplace in the Tennessee or, or, or down in Texas or something like that, it could be cheaper. So we picked what we thought was, was reasonable, $35 a day on the day of travel, $50 a day for reimbursement that while you're there at the conference. And then we don't have to worry about receipts and, and all of that stuff and following up and all that. And pretty much, I would say, just about every district around us follows that same standard reimbursement rate. So those are the two things in the regulation. But right now, it's just basically for you to um, peruse, send it out for first read. Uh, with the COVID thing, as you know, we haven't had those policy committee meetings. This one I thought was fairly simple. We could get it out have minimal discussions, not really all intensive, and keep that process flowing. As you know, we got a lot of policies that we got to bring forward is, to you. Is there a copy of the suggested expense account form that, with the attached expenses submitted to some supervisor that reviews it and signs it? Yes, every expense reimbursement has a minimum of four, three signatures which would be, I'm sorry, minimum of four signatures. It's the employee themselves, their immediate supervisor, Mr. Paluski and myself. Every employee reimbursement. Does that seem overly complicated? Yes. It can be depending on the dollar amount, yes. So this will help clean up a lot of that. All right. And it won't be much travel anyway this yeah, well, year that's because true. of- That's true, that's true. I'm sure that when we're true. reimbursing staff for mileage or something we're we have proper insurance that something happens since they're on our mileage to cover us right say that again i'm sorry so, somebody's doing something for this board or the school system okay traveling and we're reimbursing their mileage they're on a trip for us using some, their personal vehicle they're using their personal vehicle if something happened I'm sure they're going to go after them, but they're going to go after the... the their the, personal insurance would be the primary. Primary, but we have something to back that up. Yes. Because they're going to go after deep pockets. Yeah, throughout, throughout May, yeah, from yeah, the liability. So we have a liability. Because they are on business, yes. Right, so we have that back up as yes, far sir. as... Okay, mm -hmm. we're at, Okay. So um, call for the vote on the motion to send out for, for uh, informational review, information and review, uh, the policy title, employee travel, policy number 315. Regulation title, employee travel, regulation number 315.1. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So now, informational items 8.01, Governor's Emergency Education Relief Gear Funding. I was just going to ask you if you knew what gear stood for, but I'm, I'm, you get a point for that one. Well, That's I'll very good, especially this late at night. Thank you so much. Especially this late at night. Yes. So again, as uh, Ms. Harper, as you eloquently stated, it's the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. Um, it was out, the Governor, through his money that he received directly from the, through Federal Stimulus Cares money, um, one piece of that, that he allocated $10 million out to um, local school systems, our share based on, again, the Title I uh, population, and we've had discussions about how equitable that is or un inequitable that is. Um, our share of these funds is a whopping $51,634. So the plan is due to MSD is Jul on July 10th. The board will get a copy of that plan as we finalize with the executive team exactly what we're gonna do with this. Pro uh, we're thinking uh, because of this particular um, incentive that the governor has put out, he wants to focus on technology. So we will either look at additional um, uh, data plan, because as you know, in the CARES Act, we only have six months of data, so we would look at that. Perhaps we could use this to put a down payment on some of the Chromebooks that you saw this evening. Somehow, I think we need to focus on technology, um, because even the application itself says, if you're not gonna do on technology, 
what are you going to spend it on and why not? So okay. that's probably will be our focus, but we'll certainly update the board as to what the final plan is. Well, I really, we need to find out if we can get some more money for all of the PPE that we need and all the sanitizing that we need to do for our schools if we're going to be in them. That's, yes. I would love to focus on that too, as, as well. Yep. And we haven't made a decision on all those recommendations, right? Because I'm not inclined to go for 200. That's correct. I'm okay. not inclined so to buy still, second graders. Okay. So we're still looking for feedback. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, he's talking about, you know, oh, what, technology. Just, just an option. I mean, the, the focus of this is technology. And if the board or superintendent side, that's the direction we needed to go. So this could certainly be used for that. It, it satisfies sure, not, the requirements. I'm not arguing. I'm just saying to make sure we, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see us Connectivity get some of those yeah. Chromebooks fixed up. At use some of those some of the old, old Chromebooks to be able to have parts and you know some spares for our students and we do that yeah oh I know but I'm just I think this do we I'd like a crack at it before it goes out I think we ought to the board is fifty one thousand dollars oh, and so oh yeah. I thought you were talking about plans for um, the return to school no, no 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 we're talking about not, yeah that and fifty one thousand is not a lot of money. It's not a lot of first money. Of all, and that doesn't come before the board for a ruling no. like that. We're oh, happy to share with does. you what we do or what the plan is, but that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. operational. Okay. Um is that that's all that, just that's that it. This is a very brief update. Okay. Not much substance to it. Fifty one thousand dollars. Thank you. We should. There are millions, as you saw tonight, oh, that, yes. that we're going to need. Fifty-one thousand doesn't do justice. But we need to go. We need we'll, to. We call will put them. it to good use, and we'll certainly benefit the students in our classrooms. We need to call the commissioners again. Let Thank them. You. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Sir. Uh, future school board meetings: July eighth, twenty twenty, executive closed session. July fifteenth is a school board work session. Uh, July 29th is another executive closed session. August fifth, as we have already been told, is hopefully when we'll know where we're moving forward for the fall. And then August 19th is another school board work session. Um, do we need anything else to that? Is that? Okay. Uh, public comment. Mrs. Wright, have we had any other public comment? Checked. Just checked. Okay. Um, with that being said, um, do I have a motion to go into executive closed session? Proceed to general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104. I move the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County go to meet, meet in closed session to discuss appoint employment assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this body has jurisdiction to perform administrative function. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion? Um, just for clarification, we will close. We'll do adjournment and at the end of closed session. I need a little shout out real quickly to thank all the retirees that are leaving our system. Thank you for your time with our students. Thank you for being here. And we wish you all the best in your retired years and hope you have, have a good time. Enjoy yourselves. So thank you all. Have a good summer. Motion to accept. All those in favor say aye. Uh, all opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We are in executive closed session. Thank you all. Good night.